welcome to another episode of You'll Only Listen Twice, our podcast where we're taking a look at all the Bond movies, both official and unofficial. My name is Jake. My name is Troy. And I'm... I'm sorry, guys, I can't do this. You, you okay, Jim? Oh, Jesus Christ. It's just... I'm feeling kind of melancholy. Um, I haven't been quite honest with you guys, you know, I've... Uh, Joked around about Melissa, you know, my wife, but, uh, it's, uh... Your dead wife. Yes, sir, my, my dead wife. It's, it's been tough. I, I haven't, I haven't shown my emotions fully. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember rud its ghost upon the floor. Oh. Eagerly I wished oh, the morrow, yeah, yeah. vainly I had sought to borrow from the books surcease of sorrow he does this at bars sorrow for the lost melissa this has actually been kind of a problem for uh since his w dead wife died for the rare and radiant medium who the angels named melissa i don't get why he's still upset about her that was like four james bonds ago nameless here forevermore never say never again took a huge toll on us i know that that movie just brought a lot of a lot of bad memories I was attacked by Kevin McClory. That was a crazy episode, but uh, I don't know. I've been been feeling weird lately, um, and I just I just wish I could see her one more time. Mm. Wait, what? What the hell? Wait, what? What's going on? Why is there like weird like uh, otherworldly ghost sound? I'm shivering. I'm shivering. I can see my breath. I can see her face. Melissa, is that you? Is that really you? You've come what back? The fuck? Or is it water damage? Oh fuck. <laughs> You've come back? You again? Oh shit. <laughs> it wasn't enough that I had to kill myself on our honeymoon. You had to show me fucking never say never again in the south of France. Now you have to bring me back for what is basically my own personal hell. I was chilling over there. Death ain't so bad. I was partying with the other Catholics, and now here I am. Whoa, 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 oh, wait, whoa. Wait, you were Catholic this whole time? You were Catholic yeah. the whole time? Oh my God. Not once did me and Jake see you at church. Maybe it's a good thing you passed on. But Melissa, you've you've been dead for like three years now. What what could have possibly had made you uh, come back to life? Uh, a summons, basically jury duty. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is jury duty. <laughs> It's like Marvel movies for unemployed people. We all have to do it at one point. I tried to convince them that I was unfit and unqualified for this Bond podcast, considering that I hate every single James Bond movie except Casino Royale. Welcome to the yeah. club! <laughs> That's every James Bond fan. I don't Bond even fan. know why I'm here. Oh, I don't know it. why I'm here. <laughs> you summoned me for w the world is not enough. The world is Oh my god, this is a poltergeist. <laughs> why did we summon a yeah. poltergeist into <laughs> Now I remember why I was happy when you died. But uh, just just tell us a little bit about um, how you died, why you came back, what movie we're going to talk about. So uh, the story of, of how I died. Uh, well, it's a bit traumatic for me, uh, but we were in the south of France enjoying our honeymoon. That's right, it wasn't a honeymoon, you, doubly tragic. It's just like James Bond. Exactly, uh, just how I never wanted it. Uh, you were telling me you were feeling suicidally depressed and I couldn't stop talking about James Bond. Now I'm remembering. You just simply had to show me that one filming location from Never Say Never. Yeah, the fort. Yeah, despite numerous, numerous protests, <laughs> you dragged my ass over there. But you know what? It looked like a pretty great place to kill yourself. So after basically an hour's worth of mansplaining, I had just had enough. Well, welcome to three hours of mansplaining. The world is not enough. The world is not enough. Yeah. 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 You know, three years of bliss passed by without much notice. And uh, here we are. My darling dead wife, what is your relationship to the James Bond movies? My relationship is basically that of 
a prisoner in Abu Ghraib. <laughs> oh. And James Bond is Dick Cheney. Oh. You know, Whoa. a, a oh. lot of us have described it this way. Yeah, not not the first time this comparison has been drawn. <laughs> I, I've never seen Jake this sad <laughs> when you describe James Bond as Dick Cheney. Well, I'm just, I, I'm here, we're recording The World's Not Enough, and I have a ghost that is shitting on one of my my personal favorite film franchises so um, i have a little bit of a uh, some existential depression right now i i thank god you're not in a french castle thank god i'm not in a french castle i know a great place where you can kill yourself oh great what what do you think uh, of the james bond movies in general and 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 of pierce well the obvious elephant in the room is that they're misogynists <laughs> Feel free to uh, judge me for that, but uh, if you want that female demographic, name me one thing that this franchise has done that it's misogynist. Roger Moore. <laughs> Just everything with Roger Moore. <laughs> what? Well, yeah. Okay, I'll give you that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I categorically, categorically hate Roger Moore as Bond. I'm sure he was a lovely conservative person. <laughs> As opposed to the firebrand liberal that was Sean Connery? <laughs> Sean Connery had marginally better politics, but... What? They are the same! Well, no, he was for Scottish independence, right? Yeah, he was for Scottish independence. Anyone that's for Scottish independence gets brownie points in my book uh, because I hate the British. Did you know that like a 4% of our audience is British? And from Bristol specifically. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, uh, welcome to our least listened to episode. <laughs> Yeah, welcome to our least listened to episode. We have an Irish woman on the podcast. Whatever will we do? <laughs> God damn. Wait, uh, Trey's uh, Tra Tra not Irish. What are you talking about? I'm on 16th Irish. <laughs> I thought you were Italian. I'm also Italian. Isn't Melissa an Italian citizen? Or did I, I was. I was. I would prefer that you use the past tense when addressing okay. me. All right, Melissa was an Italian. Young man from Bristol. Do you, in your <laughs> life, did you enjoy Pierce Brosnan as James Bond? I enjoyed him in life as I enjoy him in death. He's very handsome. That is yet another great thing about Ireland. Ah, uh, yes. You're looking forward to when he dies and goes to hell so you can hang out with him. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> hang out. Well, oh. she did say that she went, she was hanging out with the other Catholics, so... Ah, <laughs> uh, so they did all go to hell. Yeah. <laughs> that is hell, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for any confusion. I was chilling before. I'm in hell right now. Oh. This, this is hell. So uh, this is worse than hell. That's fair. That's fair, honestly. Yeah. I would, yeah. I would probably okay. This agree. is my personal hell they're loaning you out to us i i i got some some free intern program <laughs> with them. But, uh, explain uh, to me exactly how four unemployed dudes uh talking over you about james bond for three hours is hell <laughs> i never loved you oh oh my Aww, god that's the sweetest thing <laughs> i've ever heard melissa that it, it is you you are back <laughs> <laughs> jan jan you can just edit out the words never and then you'll finally hear it. I loved you. This is actually the best intervention that we could possibly do. We have I a know. ghost in our presence who's saying she hates James Bond, she hates you, it's great. <laughs> but I can edit her however I want to make her my my perfect Melissa I always wanted. Jan is the sexiest. You, you, could, you could create your own incel version of this. Look, I was summoned here, it's hell for me, but... Hopefully this benefits you. I mean, I'm the only woman that you could possibly get on your show and I'm dead. So, hey, we have Paul. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, let's get into talking about the world is not enough. The world is not enough. Yay. But it's such a perfect place to start, to start my, my love. So, so uh poltergeist Melissa, uh, it's, it's great to have you on the show, even if you hate everything we do and everything we're talking about. <laughs> but what did you think of World's Not Enough? Did you watch it recently? Uh, and what are your thoughts? Oh, are we already at the end of the episode? All right. Yeah. The hair. <laughs> the hair. <Eight> <laughs> well, 
I watched it the day after Jan's grandmother died, and it was somehow sadder than that. That is, that is true. I would, I, I would agree. I would agree with that. In some ways, yes. Yeah, I, 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 I did not shed a tear for my grandmother, but I did for uh, Electric King. Oh, okay, valid. You did ask me what my relationship to these movies is, and if this gives you any indication, these movies are supposed to be fun. That's their no. one job. <laughs> I haven't had fun I at all. At all with oh. these movies. Not even with the clown? I'm the Joker, baby! What clown? Roger Moore dresses up as a clown, an octopus. You didn't watch Octopussy? Do you think I watch these for fun? <laughs> I watched this one out of obligation for jury duty. Oh. I didn't willingly watch this movie. I turned to Jan multiple times and asked if I could just leave. I, and, and I was very yeah. scared because you were a ghost. But like, did you not have fun when <laughs> Pierce Brosnan says, I always wanted Christmas in Turkey? Always wanted to have Christmas in Turkey. Is that not fun to you? No, I I died a little more inside. We have to talk about that joke. It doesn't make any sense to me. No, it's horrible. Is it supposed to be a play on having turkey at Christmas? That's another thing about these movies, and especially this one. What's with all the puns? Oh, that's a James Bond staple. That's a thing. That's a trope. Is just that like he... It, it keeps it light. It keeps it stupid. Yeah. I hate puns. <laughs> Well, Bond has to comment on everything. Like, when he kills somebody, he makes a funny remark about how they die. Yeah. And uh, when he's about- So he's Duke Nukem. Yeah, basically. Duke Nukem, he was the original Duke Nukem. Yeah. Yeah, back in the 60s. Yes. So- Now, if you just explain that, that's how you get your kids on board with this franchise. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. James Bond is basically like Fortnite meets Mr. Beast, okay? That, that's how <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's basically it. He's Mr. Beast if Mr. Beast was a government agent. I, I always yeah. thought Mr. Beast would be a good Bond villain, though. You know, Hitman, what if what if Hitman was, like, funny? What if Charlie Sheen had a gun? That's basically, especially in this movie, because the, yeah. it's Denise Richards yeah. is the Bond girl, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so this is our first on-screen credit of Purvis and Wade, the screenwriting duo who will stick around with the franchise uh, up until today. Yeah, the, the creators of Johnny English. In the world of espionage, there's one agent, even the Secret Service keeps secret. Johnny English. I'm here to see Pegasus. The creators of Johnny English, yeah. Wade Wade wrote for Goldeneye, but he was uncredited, yes. right? Yeah. Well, I think they uh, didn't they both uh, write for Goldeneye and they were uncredited. They might have both done Goldeneye uncredited. That's that's the thing about this movie is like uh, it's it's one of the first times where I feel like a steep like jump in like the quality of the writing from the last one where oh, we've yeah. gone from like conversations and lines that make absolutely no sense. To hear only some of them make no sense. It's not like the entire screenplay. The last one didn't have a script. Remember, Pierce was on set and he's like, do I turn left or do I turn right on this boat? And they're like, we're working on and it. And Roger Spies was just like, I, I don't fucking know. Stop asking me questions. I'm just the director. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get this out by 1997 to put value into MGM stock. Shut up. And the result is, in my opinion, a masterpiece. I, I love uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, yeah. It, it grew in my opinion. It's like neck and neck with this one for me. Yeah, uh, this one, watching it again, we'll get into it, but more about behind the scenes. Uh, so Purvis and Wade were just like, what if we did another love story? And we hearken everything back to Honor Majesty's Secret Service because people really like that one because... You know, that bond is a sensitive bond and it's where he falls in love and there's a tragic romance. What if we did that? They even titled the movie The World Is Not Enough, which is Bond's coat of arms that we find out at the book. Uh, that, that's his family motto. There's a lot of uh, visual similarities with Electric King and Tracy. The set design is colorful, kind of like how the production design of Honor Majesty Good Service is very colorful. They missed the opportunity of putting uh, Pierce Brosnan in a kilt and uh, in like a weird 60s sex orgy. Yeah, no, they they fucked up there. Yeah, uh, Ele Electric King classically uh, loves chicken and won't stop talking about it. <laughs> they missed the opportunity to have a whole sequence where Pierce Brosnan is dubbed and everyone thinks he's gay because- Yes. <laughs> Melissa looks so what? confused. <laughs> Yeah, get used to it. These are all things that actually happened 
and beloved by Jan Classic on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Yes, very near and dear to my heart. Another banger. Yeah. Another banger. <laughs> it is another banger. Do you want to know uh, some of the directors that were considered? Was it Michael Haneke, one of the directors? I wish. <laughs> That'd be funny. But one of the, uh, the the directors they were considering, they were uh, they were thinking of Joe Dante, which would have oh, been wacky. that would have been cool. Yeah, that would have been, cool. been really, been really bizarre. They were later looking at Peter Jackson. Apparently, Barbara Broccoli really liked Heavenly Creatures and wanted to use them. But then after the Frighteners, she was like, no. Fuck this guy. <laughs> this guy sucks. But but could Peter Jackson really do action? Uh, well, it, did you see Lord of the Rings? <laughs> I don't watch nerd shit. I only watch James Bond. The correct answer. Clearly, the man we need to do action is uh, Michael Apted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. The seven Up movies, all those six flips. Yeah, the director of The Coal Miner's Daughter, you know, is great. But you know who the else they considered? Jan, you're gonna, you're gonna love this. They considered... Yeah, Jan, here it is. They considered... A little guy named Alfonso Cuaron. Sandra, I'm going to give you her piece. Oh my <laughs> god, we should have had him on for the podcast. <laughs> Wait, can I say why they didn't have him? So apparently Alfonso Cuaron got as far as to have a meeting with the producers, and he's looking at the script, and I think he was like, why are we having this boat chase on the Thames? Why isn't it on the Hudson? Why don't we have James Bond in New York? Why does he have to be in England? <laughs> Why is he His British? Pitch was to take him was to take him back to New York, like live and let die. <laughs> yeah, he need to take him back to his roots. But Alfonso lives in England. Yeah, he lives. Yeah, there. but that's what doesn't make any sense. They were like, I don't, we don't think you get James Bond. He was apparently like they stopped talks because they were like, he doesn't understand James Bond. Yeah, this guy sounds like a moron. <laughs> If this isn't what happened, Alfonso can come on our podcast anytime. Explain yourself. And refute that one. And clear up the details, because yes. uh, obviously you either really hated England or really <laughs> wanted to go to New York. <laughs> either one of the two. Mr. Five-time Oscar winner Alfonso Cuaron, we invite you to come on this podcast with 50 subscribers and explain yourself and your terrible <laughs> decisions. Now, caveat, all of our guests are ghosts. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still think that uh, Guardon Bond could be interesting. Oh, it'd be pretty fun. I don't know. I like editing in my Bond. Never say never, Jan. Well, well that's, that is true. But uh, I mean, I, we'll talk about it later. But um, I still think that Danny Boyle was the greatest. Uh, we were robbed. James Bond moment. Oh, I 100% I agree. Yeah, well, we'll get into that. I just realized, though, that um, Itumama Tambien could have been the title of a Bond movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Itumama Tambien. <laughs> but it, it, it would have been it would have been starring uh, Sean Connery then. Just Sean Connery looking at you yeah. going like, I fucked your mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he does sing Does Your Mother Know in Mamma Mia, Pierce. Oh, that's true. That's true. He does. No, no, that's that's the the Baratsky. That's Christine, that's Christine Baranski. Baranski. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I confuse oh. them. Very similar. Okay, you've alienated your gay demographic now, so we had a gay demographic. Just be careful. Yeah, you're introducing many demographics that we just don't have. <laughs> so remember when we were afraid we were going to lose the Bristol demographic, and then <laughs> someone on YouTube told us you don't have a Bristol. <laughs> demographic. Shout out to that guy. Don't, don't encourage the commenters. <laughs> Spitting facts. Okay, was there was there any behind the scenes we need to know about Jake besides uh, finding Michael Apted inexplicably? <laughs> oh yeah, Mike. Well, no, they picked Michael Apted because they wanted someone who could get a great performance out of women. So they specifically <laughs> picked him because of the coal miner's daughter. I'm not making this up. And enough, which had not been made yet. Yeah, Melissa, you do. That's his greatest. You do. Film. You do have a connection with enough. I do. Oh. Uh, what is that? Yes, that's actually how I know Michael Apted as a director is enough, which is a classic film. And Rob Reiner's favorite movie. Uh, really? Carl Reiner. Oh. Uh, before Carl Reiner died, he tweeted about a few things and he said that Enough was an underrated classic. And I agree. Never seen it. Um, dead minds think alike. And we have the ghost of Carl Reiner here hey. to talk about it. It's, hey. it's me, the ghost of Carl Reiner. Remember my son, Rob? He made <laughs> North. <laughs> <laughs> 
Rob, Rob is the Goro Miyazaki of the right. <laughs> I'm going to say something controversial, yet brave. Uh, enough is a better film than the world is not enough. I think I agree with you. Well, no one has ever seen it besides the dead, <laughs> so I guess we'll never know. I guess you have a point. The world is not enough is not enough. Oh. Oh. No. Melissa, you're a bad ghost. The joke was right there and you didn't take it. Sorry, I'm just, I'm rewriting a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to the movie itself because um, the only other thing is that I think this is the first Pierce Brosnan movie that they actually shot at Pinewood. What the fuck is Pinewood? It's the home of the James Bond movies. They've been shooting there since Dr. No. It is one of the premier English studios and they built a giant stage called the 007 stage, uh, where a lot of movies have shot there. Wow. Yeah, come on, Melissa, this is common knowledge. Dead wives, am I right? We have to explain everything. <laughs> I'm to starting go. to think, Melissa, I'm starting to think this dead ghost wife isn't really supportive of your podcast, or she would have listened to the Spy Who Loved Me episode where we talked about it. That's this. right. You, you would know what Pinewood Studios is if you listened to this in hell. <laughs> <laughs> Even the dead have better things to do. Oh my goodness, this is getting too real. <laughs> Let's talk about The World Is Not Enough. The world is not enough. But it's such a perfect place for <laughs> us to start. All right, the longest po opening credit sequence ever. Which originally, it wasn't supposed to be and that way. perhaps the greatest. Yeah, no, it, it, it's I one agree. of the best. It's pretty good. The weird thing is, is that originally... That wasn't supposed to be like the entire the entire sequence wasn't supposed to be those two set pieces. It was originally just supposed to be the stuff in Spain where he jumps out of the window. Mm -hmm. And that was the big scene. Michael Apted, while editing, it was just like, wait a second. This is too lame to be an opening sequence. He's like, this isn't really anything. I mean, it's still pretty fun where he jumps out of the window. <laughs> yeah, but then like the cool thing is like. It keeps building, and then, like, we're in M's office, and you're like, the credits haven't even started. What's gonna happen? <laughs> you know? Right. Well, yeah, that's the weird thing, is then you have the M and Money Penny scene before the boats. Right. The beginning is very, like, cramped. Like, that office scene is very cramped for me, and I can't really tell what's going yeah. on. I love that he uses a, a corpse as a, <laughs> as a support for his rap. No, 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 he's not dead, because there's oh, yeah. a joke where he, like... Uh, the guy realizes he's being tied and he's being pulled to the window and he grabs onto the table <laughs> and Bond is stuck and Bond has to use his weight to bring him down and the table leg breaks. Just uh, using a body for that is like such a Pierce thing to do. <laughs> oh yeah. He just gives zero fucks. No, I think he's like the most brutal Bond, especially in this movie. He's like taking no prisoners. Well, yeah, that's the thing. People say that Craig is the most brutal Bond. But I do agree, this one's more brutal because Craig seems more brutal because he feels bad about the things that he does. Pierce does yeah. not give a shit. <laughs> like, yeah, he it, does not he care. Does not well, care. he's happy. He's so far past well, that Well, he's point. having so much fun doing all these things, you know? Yeah, he's got such draw That's to what be. makes it even, like, harder, is he's, like, smiling when he's, like, strangling you throwing you around as a human shield. He, he likes the job a lot. <laughs> he's he's the husk of a, of a human being. This is like what Daniel Craig should have become, you know, <laughs> like down the line, just a complete husk of a human. He should just get like more quippy and more like, like happy about yeah. everything as he goes. <laughs> yeah. Cause he's been brainwashed, you know, he's been brainwashed by the British government <laughs> to just become this killing machine that loves killing. Yeah. It's like this is the only way to cope. Right. <laughs> he doesn't go, real men don't go to therapy. They become double O agents. There you go. Well, I was going to say, I was impressed because this is my first time seeing the film. And oh. I was like, oh, this is so contained. What what an interesting subversion for the opening. And then it becomes the biggest <laughs> set piece yes. of all time. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> It's great. No, no, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you agree with this, Melissa, but I feel like this is... Uh, the best thing in the movie is the opening and also like the worst thing in the movie because it's like the best and then everything else is kind of not as great. Well, the movie can't live up to it. That's, that's the thing. thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it's like if that was the climax, it would have been the easily probably the best climax in any of this these series, right? Like in terms of a set yeah. piece. Uh, right, that's what I'm saying. That's climax, like it's such a strong start, but they didn't follow it up with, like, I don't know, did you feel the same way? Yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing about having Michael Apted 
as a director, right, is they intentionally wanted a performance character oriented Bond movie. And that's what they got. But to the movie's detriment, there are no big action set pieces that feel as massive except for this boat thing. I agree. Well, and it's also weird because you're coming from like Tomorrow Never Dies, which is like all the most intensely fast paced James Bond movies where there is it's like the accident that fucks so hard. Yeah. Yeah. No, like every action set piece tops the last. It has no time. Like it's not concerned with who James Bond is as a character, really. Because even with the character, it's <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. We need to get to... Well, it does. It tries to with Paris, but it it's so quick. The Paris Carver is a well, Yeah, but, but like, it's so quick that you're just like, we got, we got to move on to the next sequence. Like, Bond is sad right now. Now he's laughing in the back of the BMW. Yeah, uh, Tomorrow Never Dies is definitely a don't think about it kind of movie. Just keep going. It's kind of like a, the rise of Skywalker. World's Not Enough is trying harder to be more of a character piece, uh, which I kind of think we'll get we'll get into it later on. But generally, I got to think that the character stuff isn't developed enough to take over the action. Yeah, I don't think it's strong at all. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's strong at all. It takes away from the pacing of the movie, so the movie is a lot slower. Right. Than... Yeah, this is more of a... I'm trying to compare it to, like, other Bond movies. There definitely is an attempt to be more of, like, the living daylight, like, experience. Than... Well, it's honestly... Well, Melissa, you were gonna say something. Uh, I hate puns. <laughs> okay. okay. Especially... Sexual harassment puns. Oh, like. you, you come in here with that woke shit again. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Is is the after like the National Democratic Convention? Like what is going on here? Because <laughs> if there's anything that happens at the National Democratic Convention, it's a lack of sexual harassment. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. I, I'm, I'm... Are you saying that the scene where uh, Pierce Brosnan <laughs> gives Money Penny a cigar? Oh, like I like it's a that. Dildo, I like is... that. <laughs> well, I didn't know what it was. I'm like. Like, is that a dildo? No, that's so confusing, because in the office at Spain... It's like a single-packaged cigar. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's com- white rubber. <laughs> if you thought that was a dildo, you don't know women at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's, far, it's too small, I know. You know, a lot of people say that, like, there's a million years, like, indifference between Die Another Day and Casino Royale, and it's true. But I also feel like there's a million years in difference between this one and Die Another Day. Like, oh, Die yeah, Another Day is such, a, sure. such an outlier, you know? Because this one's so similar yeah. to the other two. But in Die Another Day, like, here Money Penny is still acting, like, defiant to James Bond. She's not, like, flicking the <laughs> in a VR set. She still wants to date him. Like, I feel like with each movie, she becomes progressively, like, more despondent at him not dating her. But yeah, yeah it's a massive leap from where they are here to VR fantasy. I think this is the only like memorable money penny apart from Lois Maxwell. Uh she is from Downton Abbey and she is delightful. Yeah, she's good in Downton Abbey. Yeah, I would agree with Jan. I'm sorry. Oh my god, who played Money Penny in the Naomi Harris. I'm sorry, Naomi. Yeah, Harris. no, she's an excellent actress, but yeah, no, no, but... I think she's good in Skyfall when she's doing like field stuff, but when she becomes money penny. Where they just make her a moron who James Bond has to explain what she's doing wrong all the time, and then at the end she's like, I'm where I belong, behind the desk. Well, <laughs> I, I ex- excuse the oh. James Bond uh, movie for being a little bit sexist. During my lifetime, I don't think so. Yeah. Before that, it's fine. I will not sit here. And see this podcast devolve into wokeness just because we have a woman here, okay? She's a ghost. <laughs> She's not even a lot. Come on, guys. Let's keep the eye on the price. <laughs> Jake doesn't want us to be a hate group. Jan doesn't want us to be. Yeah, two. no. We're, we're stuck between two poles here. And I just don't want to be here. <laughs> but anyway, back to like what is actually going on on screen. So James Bond has taken money from Spain. We, that would have been the cold yeah. open. There was some sort of fighting that, to be honest, I've seen this a couple times and I still don't understand how the fight plays okay, out. Okay, so office. basically, uh, I'll, I'll explain oh, it. Oh, boy. So Bond is Swiss Bank in Spain and they have money for this wealthy industrialist as uh, Robert King. And Bond is there because the money was transferred over to the Swiss Bank. They're about to give it up to MI6, who's going to give it to Robert King. And Bond is there because he's investigating the death of double agent who was investigating this, was killed during the process of obtaining this money. And Bond wants to know who's behind it. And Bond, I'm so glad we have you here, Jake, to explain the plots of these movies because I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I, even when 
I'm watching it, it's like leaving my brain. Well, uh, it's it's leaving my brain right now. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. don't even know what. Yeah. Everything you just said, I could not repeat it. I could not repeat it. <laughs> Another double O agent has died. He's investigating the other guy who died, who was investigating the money that they were had held, that they were investigating to the guy that was <laughs> doing the deal with the money. And it's a Swiss bank, but they're not in Switzerland. <laughs> Ah, now I get it. Now I get it. Yeah. And then and then they all kill each other and then and then it doesn't matter. Yeah. So no, yeah, no, exactly. Well, it, it's like, okay, I got the money back, but who's behind or who's behind the death of this agent? Turns out that this is all part of the plan that Bond was chosen to bring the money back to MI6 because it is rigged to explode by Sir Robert King, who is M's best buddy from college. No, it's going to explode in front of Sir Robert King. It's going to, yeah, explode in front of when he walks into the room because his pin is a radio detonator. So that means someone from the inside planned to have Robert King assassinated. And M. The cigar girl who gave Bond the cigar is also the hot air balloon lady yes. who is setting off the bomb or is she there to pick off survivors? She's there to uh, pick off the survivors, survivors just in case... It didn't work, I think. Yeah. Do you know who the cigar, what the cigar lady's uh, called? Cigar lady. Cigar lady. Oh, just cigar lady. Purvis and Wade, baby. Cigar girl, I think, officially. The actress who plays the cigar lady was supposed to play Electric King, but her English wasn't that good. So they just gave her the role where she had to learn only one line. Not from him. Not from him. Not from him. But Sophie. Sophie Marceau. So. Uh, Sophie Marceau. Did you know Q was supposed to die? Like at one point, Q was going to die in this explosion? No. I heard that uh, Desmond Llewellyn was supposed to be Electric King originally. Yeah, that's true. Renard is just rubbing Q like so smooth. <laughs> so, <laughs> so smooth, so warm. Do you feel this? Do you feel pleasure, Renard? But I don't think Desmond Llewellyn could ever convince us that he liked James Bond because he hated that Aww. movie. No, they, ha they have a more playful banter. They shared a room in License to Kill. He was a lodger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Q is a total drag queen. He absolutely reads James Bond for filth, and then he just makes a dramatic exit out of the film. It's very RuPaul. That's true. It's queer coded. Yeah. <laughs> this is perhaps the greatest Q scene of all time. He's my favorite. Yeah, for He's sure. He's my favorite. What do you guys think of the boat chase? Like, oh, it's awesome. Oh, the boat chase is the best it's boat chase like the in these movies. Thing of it's all it's time. the it's it's the greatest scene in the movie, like for sure. Oh yeah. He's on the Thames. He's in front of Parliament. There are multiple shots where. It's Pierce is driving the boat. Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> like, and she sweat. Yes. This has never happened before. Like <laughs> <laughs> This is the same year he did the Thomas Crown Affair and both in the boat scene and this and in that like wind sailing scene in Thomas Crown Affair. I'm like, holy crap, Pierce is actually on the water. Pierce is finally, he's been like kind of stoic, you know, in the past two movies. Here he's really unlocking his uh, Tobey Maguire and Spider-Man 3 energy. He's just, during this intro, he just keeps doing these yells like, ah! <laughs> and these funny faces. It's incredible. Yeah, it's pretty great. I was going to say, this movie definitely has the most, like, contorted uh, Pierce Brosnan face. Uh, insert clip here of him uh, with the neck thing and his like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> incredible. It is my oil. Oh. Mine. And my family's. Until Mamma Mia. Until Mamma Mia. What, does Meryl Streep uh, choke him out while he's masturbating? A deleted <laughs> scene, deleted yes, scene. Yes, it's the best yeah. scene. Okay. That's in Mamma Mia 2, here he goes again. Yeah, that's that's the that's the post credit <laughs> scene, is uh, fully naked Meryl Streep and 65-year-old Pierce Brosnan just like doing some BDSM. <laughs> oh my, excuse me. <laughs> There's not even any Mom, uh, ABBA song in that scene. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. <laughs> Weirdly, it looks like it was shot in a camcorder. Yeah, it was shot in a camcorder. Yeah. <laughs> From like a closet. And they're not looking. They're not looking at and the camera. And you can hear the like... cameraman breathing. <laughs> Who directed Mamma Mia? Ah, uh, the bitch that did uh, uh, The Iron Lady. Phyllida Lloyd. Yeah. What? The, the Iron 
lady was not directed. No, it wasn't. Neither was <laughs> Mamma Mia. <laughs> well, we all know that uh, the true Margaret Thatcher movie is for your eyes only. Uh, well, as we all know, yeah. Yeah, because uh, Margaret Thatcher, as we all remember, uh, has phone sex with a parrot. Give us my kids. Give us my kids. Well, really, Mr. Bond. <laughs> but the boat's incredible. I yeah. mean, they used all the on Pinewood. I guess they they definitely took advantage of the studio space because there there's yeah. all these like restaurant sets and things just destroyed as he goes through. It's on the boat. so great, and then he's driving on the street. Yeah. <laughs> Moonraker, Moonraker callback. Yes, yes. Well, and then there's the part where the cops are like they're locking a car's tires, like like they're the parking guys, and then Bond just goes by and sprays water on. No, them. it's it's great, but like. <laughs> When it gets on land, I'm like, this is amazing, but it would be like A++++ if they brought back the wine guy from the Spike Love. <laughs> if the wine guy and the pigeon came back, this would be the best like movie ever. easily the best scene in history. Ever. <laughs> and it, it is impressive for how long it goes on that it's interesting the whole time. Because normally in this franchise, once he gets into a boat, to quote Paul, it's death. Once anyone yeah. in a Bond movie gets into a boat, you're like, oh, God. <laughs> gets on a boat it, it, it's true and this also the scene kind of reminds me of uh la the last crusade boat chase in uh venice like yeah uh, it, 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 it kind of has the same yeah uh, vibe it's, it's leveled up you're like how can it get better he's driving on land how can it get better they're in a hot air balloon <laughs> it culminates uh in the newly built o2 arena which if i i totally see it like if i was barbara yeah. broccoli and i saw that thing i'm like oh my god, this is the ugliest building I've ever seen. We need to have, like, a, an action sequence here. <laughs> you know, like... It's you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know you're in for... Yeah, they're taking advantage of, of all the sites of London, which is pretty impressive, because somehow these movies... <laughs> <laughs> like one of the stagiest franchises where like they can't even convince you they're in Miami. Yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly they're just destroying London. St. Petersburg and destroying London, like flat right. it. You know, it's pretty awesome. When you when there is the real MI6 building and then they cut to a close-up and a speedboat shoots out of one of the windows, you know you're in for a good time. Apparently dive. they were worried about how MI6 would react to this movie, but when they did the explosion scene in a screening for MI6, everyone cheered and hooted and hollered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, Great. It just turns out that everyone at MI6 hates their job and hates that building. Uh, Paul, you're right. Like, uh, uh, allowing uh, James Bond crew to film in your city is kind of like allowing a hobo to stay in your apartment like you think it's gonna be fun <laughs> but then he destroys everything <laughs> all right well can we talk about the title sequence are we allowed to? no no the ending the ending where he breaks his arm and it goes into the title sequence and you watch james bond in silhouette like walk away with like his what, a, what a horrible transition <laughs> i love it <laughs> no, well it's it's really funny because he lands onto the building and he catches himself. So he's like, theoretically, still like 100, 200 feet yeah. in the air. And he drops <laughs> down and walks James away. And you're Bond. taking the title sequence literally when it does that. And you're just like, that's bizarre. But now we got to talk about the title sequence. We got to talk about garbage. Oh, garbage. The most appropriate name for a band associated with this franchise, garbage. And what <laughs> a banger song they've it's produced. It's great. It's like one of the top 10 Bond themes for me. It's my favorite for, sure. for the Brosnan era. But then why didn't you like Tomorrow Never Dies? Because this is good and Tomorrow <sighs> Never Dies is bad. What? Okay, Melissa, go for it. Tomorrow Never Dies is too slow. This is like percussive yes, buildup. Exactly, Jake. Oh, Jake yeah, Melissa. It. Excuse me. Uh, you're wrong. Just categorically wrong. Tomorrow Never Dies is better. Then the world is not what? enough as a no, I, I, I agree. I Thank agree. Thank you, Paul. Thumbs up. No, Thank you. no, 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 Th this no, is, no. This is the incorrect opinion. Yes, no, Melissa's the tiebreaker we needed, Paul. Yay. She's a ghost. God we, damn it. We needed a female perspective. We needed it's it's the female perspective. It's the woman, the feminist, and the producer mm -hmm. with giant breasts. Mm -hmm. Go on, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> We're the fact. <laughs> we are legion. I never thought I would hear Jan describe himself as a feminist. 
this is genuinely a big well, game. Well, remember, we're trying to get into Nebula, so uh, okay. I, I should I shouldn't speak oh, over right. my female guests. Uh, go over, Mo. Yeah, Melissa, please please explain yourself. Please explain your incorrect opinion. <laughs> and then we have to do a counter argument because we still haven't explained the correct opinion. Didn't you explain the correct opinion all of the last episode? No. You you no. dissed the the song last time, uh, and I'm here to correct it. But we didn't talk about the world is not enough last episode. This is the world is not enough episode. Look, I like that song. I like the world is not enough. I think thematically it's very appropriate, uh, considering uh, Electra King's character and her relationship with Bernard. Thematically, the lyrics are working. I think it's fun. Uh, but I don't really see how you can distinguish between uh, Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough as like a tempo issue, right? Uh, you said that Tomorrow Never Dies is too slow. Uh, yeah. When literally uh, No Time to Die, as Jan says, feels like Ambien. Uh, I think the tempos. <laughs> well, we haven't talked about No yeah. Time to Die yet. All right. Cut that out. Cut that out. Cut that out. But I don't <laughs> no, think I'm the tempo it. for I don't think the tempo for Tomorrow Never Dies differs that much from The World Is Not Enough. I agree. Uh, what I really? Yeah. It's a little more fast paced, maybe, but not by much. Maybe, but mm. not drastically. Um, and I like that Tomorrow Never Dies plays with dynamics. Uh, there is build up to a release, which feels very Bond to me. Yeah, like sex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, yes. I, if you, um, <laughs> I've done the sex before, so why don't you tell me what it is? Okay, and, guys, uh, hurry up. <laughs> speed it up. The one time you let the woman speak, uh, the one time <laughs> I actually have something to contribute to this movie is the theme song. I will defend that to my death. I think it's a fantastic top five Bond song. I think the lyrics are fantastic. Cheryl Crow is fantastic. I think the instrumentation is great. It even has some sort of like balalaika type reference to From Russia With Love. I think they did their homework with yeah. that song. We should have had you on the Tomorrow Never Dies episode. <laughs> I know, uh -huh. you have a lot to say about Tomorrow Never Dies. I have so much more to say about that than the Garbage song, even though I do like that song. I think Tomorrow Never Dies is stronger. I think, but I think <laughs> it's stronger. It's not a garbage song, it's good. Okay, I think that the chorus is terrific. Um, and I think the instrumentation, you know, it, it feels like classic Bond to me. It's what I imagine um, you could do with Alana Del Rey. Uh, Bond song, which I am still r rooting for. Uh, oh, I yeah. will sign any mm -hmm. petition yeah, you great. put in front of me. We didn't get an Amy Winehouse song. That's uh, that's But Lana Del Rey is an obvious choice, and I don't understand why they haven't chosen her yet. She has clearly auditioned for it her entire career. She has songs that already could just be copy pasted into a Bond film. Do they feel uh, she's not popular? Is a great example. That clearly can't be it. She's more popular than Sam Smith. <laughs> In the mid 2010s, yeah. Sam yeah. Smith was huge. I do think Lana Del Rey would do a better song than Sam Smith because Sam Smith is very, very mopey. But well, that's for a later episode. Lana Del Rey is depressed, but she can make that more dramatic. Like uh, that's James Bond. It's a depressed fun guy. She is written in the stars for a Bond song, and I yeah. don't know why they're denying her that. She is also a legend, and I will say, this woman has worked in a random Waffle House for free. She would not ask too much money for it either. She would gladly do it. You know what would be really great is if they hired uh, Lana Del Rey to do the next Bond song, but they hired her to sing uh, Never Say Never Again, but just in her voice. But the oh, she would do song. great. Oh, I love that. Would be beautiful. <laughs> I mean, fuck Michelle Legrand and his score for <laughs> Never Say Never Again. But I mean, the score is bad, but hey. I think that song is like fundamentally fucked and hey, Lana Del Rey can save awful. it. But <laughs> it, that's the worst one. It's the best one. The worst one is License to Kill. But On the World is Not Enough. What I like about this song is Shirley Manson did her homework and she said that she kind of kind of listened to the core of all the Bond themes and it's a propulsive theme. It has strong point of view. And I just like, yes. what it does is it launches. See, if we're going to bring up the comparison, Tomorrow Never Dies is like a opium haze where it's what? like, Tomorrow Never Dies. It's, it's one of those, it's not that Tomorrow Never Dies is a bad song that I don't like. I, I still like the song fine. It's just that, it's like what Troy says, it's like a little bit laid back. 
there's nothing like that really builds up on Wrong. like comparatively <laughs> to World's Not Enough. World's Not Enough is just Wrong. like it's like a more you know seductive vocal and seductive. performance. I would yeah. say compared to just like this is more the Shirley Bassey just. Bombast, exactly right? and i think the bombast is very important to getting you in the mood for a bond adventure but what about diamonds are forever that song is pretty slow yeah what about what about skyfall skyfall has the bombast skyfall has the reflection but then let the sky fall let the sky fall well if tomorrow never dies i can't even really tell you and i, I if i'm being honest that's part of it every time i think of tomorrow never dies in my head it turns into the world is not enough. Tomorrow never <laughs> dies. Yeah, that's never awful. Dies. That's awful. Yeah. You're not Cheryl Crow. You can't save it. It's a bad song elevated by a good <laughs> singer. No, no, it's good. No, you were, he was singing the tune of the world is yeah. not enough. <laughs> I, I couldn't. Wait, what? <laughs> I, I said, tomorrow oh. never dies. That's the world is not enough. <laughs> See, indistinguishable. <Yeah. laughs> but uh, I, I've said it before, and I must reiterate. That was the, I fucking forgot the fucker's name the 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 guy who did Morris Binder. Hack. Um, I <laughs> I am so glad to be out of Binderland. <laughs> oh my god! Well, Daniel Kleiman is the OP of the Bond. These are so now, good. They're all so fucking every good. single one. They're always completely d visually different because it, once you get to the 80s maurice bender kind of does variations on yeah, the he's same out of ideas. He's sequence asleep. basically yeah. <laughs> and then here like from tomorrow never dies tomorrow never dies is about like goldeneye you have like the fall of the soviet yeah, union the, the inside of my brain uh, tomorrow never dies is the tv lady and then here we got oil ladies because yeah. it's about oil yeah. <laughs> So great. When it's real liquid, it looks fantastic. When yes. it's uh, MS Paint uh, CG liquid, it's not quite as good. I do feel, you know? for me at least, I'm very harsh on the Brosnan openings because I think in general the CGI is aged poorly. But this one looks great. This is the one I'm like, okay with because i think it looks really cool and the song slaps and uh, the liquid and it all like ties together so well pretty pretty great intro then the movie kind of falls off I, it doesn't it doesn't fall off the bandwagon for me but it definitely it's like a view to a kill situation where it never reaches that high again well because this is a moody character drama yeah no this is a moody character study about how it is. bond need uh, the only person that bond can connect with is someone who's just as if not more self-destructive than he is <laughs> much like casino royale we must go back to scotland after a big explosion yes. and i love i don't know if those are the actual scotland mi6 offices but it's just a castle <laughs> like every yeah. every office in scotland is just a castle i guess yep it's it's great i i love it you know uh, again we'll uh, reference another franchise that we love here the mission impossible movies like i love in those movies how they like always vary it up you know it's always kind of like oh the uh, IMF exploded, and now we have to do this, all this thing. Wrote, that's like all of them, right? But I, I love in this. Or it's like it's kind of like the Dark Knight too, where it's like they blew up Wayne Manor, and now we're in this other place, you know? Exactly, exactly. Like I love it when it, it makes it feel like it has more stakes. Like we're not in the usual. To talk about a movie that someone on Letterbox has made the very persuasive point to me at least that the dark knight rises is a remake of the world is not enough no that's that's exactly what i was thinking of when i was watching me and jake were talking about yeah this. paul and i were talking <laughs> about Can i just this? briefly touch on something with the dark knight rises why is it a big deal that he gives joseph gordon levitt the cave when he never used that cave in universe as batman <laughs> he not once put he put a closet in that cave with a costume and he put a computer i mean yeah that's what the bat cave is it's a giant closet there's a giant computer normally <laughs> it's a garage he parks yeah. his car there that, that that he does that without the giant computer like it's just storage there's a computer in there it's it's like a it's it's like a normal like macbook but it's a computer <laughs> It's just Bruce Wayne's MacBook. I didn't clear it of all my apps and my files. It's an iPad mini. <laughs> it's actually Troy's computer. Like, <laughs> Joseph Gordon-Levitt's like, I finally tracked the Joker to, ah, it died. All right, I got to charge it. Now I have to wait an hour to download yeah. uh, four gigabytes. <laughs> four gigabytes. Uh, so Bond is not given the assignment because his arm is or his shoulder is fucked up 
And so he needs to fuck the nurse <laughs> in order to in front of the Bernard Lee painting. Before that, this starts in, um, you know, in a, in a funeral, which yeah. I'm like, there you go. There's the Johnny English connection. Everything in order, English? I think you'll find it's rather more than just in order, sir. You're now entering the most secure location in the whole of England. <laughs> that movie also starts in a funeral. <laughs> Wade and Purvis, baby, coming out strong with uh, funerals. And you meet Electric King, and like she's like a daughter to M. I, I guess they're just close friends, and they really do treat her like she's M's daughter. Well, uh, M is always talking about like how much she cares for this family and how it pained her to suggest to uh, Sir Robert King to not pay the ransom when she was kidnapped by Renard, mm. which turns out to be very important. <laughs> uh, Melissa, tell us your thoughts on Sophie Marceau. I love Sophie Marceau. Uh, kind of like Michael App did, I already had a relationship with her as an actress. You had a relationship with Sophie Marceau? I wish. Um, oh. That's very interesting information. Oh, <laughs> no. Uh, I loved Braveheart when I was a kid. Sure, make fun of me for liking a Mel Gibson movie. Why, are you a racist? No, I love Scotland. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she's in that. She's beautiful. Uh, I also saw her in a little-known French movie called Firelight. Uh, I watched it with my mom. So I was already very familiar with her way before this movie. So I was excited to see her in this. Why are her and Isabella Johnny two separate people? Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> they look exactly that is a good the point. same. Yeah, th I, I, we should start a GoFundMe to just like combine them. <laughs> when I see Isabella Johnny and Sophie Marceau, I'm like, this is too many of them. No. <laughs> There could be only one. They got dark hair and bangs. It gives you the Bernard Lee experience of seeing double. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Booz. <laughs> no, uh, she's beautiful. I don't know, you know, her performance in a more serious, dramatic way doesn't necessarily work, but I think Aww. she's charming enough. I think she's good at a villainous, sort of seductive character. I think she naturally has that you know, screen presence that can work. Although I've seen her do vulnerable stuff as well. Uh, here, she she works for the more superficial aspects of just, you know, she's glamorous and you buy it. You know, she, you buy that she's completely different from Denise Richards, who, oh my God, I just can't <laughs> buy her as a scientist at all. Down there, it's all weapons grade plutonium, reasonably safe, which I've spent the last six months trying to clean up. So if you need any protection at all, it's from me. I was gonna say, if we're setting the bar for Sophie Marceau as we don't know if Sophie Marceau is good, then everyone else in this movie is okay. Just... I'm gonna, I'm gonna. This is gonna be my new uh, Brit Eklund. I, I think Denise Richard does a fine job. <laughs> I also don't hate Denise Richards She's in this okay. movie. She's yeah, okay. Denise Richards is fine. Yeah, what? Okay, for I, I heard for how, how many decades? Like she can't be a scientist. I'm watching. I'm like. Why not? And Pierce, Bro and Pierce Brosnan's a spy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's just, the two it's of a them movie. work together really well in that they both just seem way, way too dumb to be doing what they're doing. Yeah, so they're yeah kind of, they're exactly. Well <laughs> exactly. No, they're, they're, be they're beautiful morons and they pull it off yeah. well. But it's like, it's not the most ludicrous thing to ever happen in this franchise, the fact that Denise no. Richards is a scientist. Yeah, no, it isn't really like, uh, and Denise Richards, to be fair, is not a bad actress. No, she does fine. No, she does they fine. don't give her much to work no, with. No, the character is nothing, but she does. I mean, she's better. Like, the thing is, we've had Holly Goodhead and Stacey Sutton. Oh, like, if you had those two characters, and then you're turning your nose up at Christmas Jones. Who the fuck is Stacey Sutton? That's Tanya Roberts in A View to a Kill. What? <laughs> yeah. Well, to be fair, Lois Childs is at least a better actress with uh, uh with just a shittier written character. <laughs> but how is a movie with a character named Christmas Jones over two hours? I'll just never understand it. That, that's like, Paul's it, question. It, the the feminist opinion <laughs> that these movies are sometimes okay, but why are they ever over two hours? Why? Like, why? why? <laughs> I'm miserable. I'm miserable. Like it's it's weightless. One of the best things about Tomorrow Never Dies. It's one of the shortest. <laughs> it's a minute under two hours. It zips, it zips. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I simply cannot concentrate on these movies. That's why, like, when in the in the Craig era, they gave the, the these movies, like, the fucking Dark Knight treatment of making them all, like, 
two hours and 40 minutes. And it's like, why? why? Stop it. Stop. <laughs> That's the thing. It's wild. Like, I feel as a generation, I, I feel we all want shorter movies, but every movie we watched in our teen and 20s were all like four hours long. And I'm like, why? I mean, That's true. <laughs> if it's a good movie, it doesn't matter. But every movie was three hours. Are you talking about the Snyder Cut again? All of them. Everything. Every single movie. Even House of Cards. That was like 12 hours long. That's true. That's right. Every movie. And it and it is also starring a molester. Um, wait, also, wait, what's the also, first movie we were talking about? James Bond. <laughs> no. All right. Well, one oh. is a, an actual molester. One is just a fictional molester. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. let's get back to the movie. Yes, the QC. All right. So we're in the Scottish castle. Has he already had sex with the doctor? Yes. Q. Dr. Warm Flash. That's her name. Wait, her warm name. what? Warm flesh. Warm flesh? Like she's having hot flashes? Well, I think it's supposed to sound like warm flesh, but it's but not. But it sounds like menopause. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it sounds it's, like a hot They changed flash. one vowel. But she's a doctor. She's having hot flashes? Well, when she's with Pierce Brosnan. Oh, what, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm a creep. Um, <laughs> okay, so we've settled that he ha he hits on the nurse. Okay, can we talk about Q? <laughs> yes, Q, please. One of the greatest Q scenes of all time because it's like Q is now so old that now they're setting up a, a new Q while the old Q is still alive. R. <laughs> yeah, R. Yeah. Yeah, was there any particular reason, Jake, this was the movie where they're like, we need, he needs an escape yeah. plan. Always have an escape plan. <laughs> here's, the f here's the funniest thing. Is that they, I think for a while they were going like, Desmond Llewellyn, he's getting up there. Uh, we should probably think about future proofing it so we have like an assistant that will come in and take over eventually. So like it, he wasn't going to retire. This wasn't supposed to be his last movie, but this is like when they're introducing the new Q with John Cleese and uh, setting that up so that they don't have to worry about it later on. Unfortunately, Desmond Llewellyn died in a car crash. A month after this movie came out. What? Yeah, a month after this movie came out. Natural causes didn't kill that fucker? I know. That was my exact same reaction last week. So it was like Leslie Jordan. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, it's fucking- I didn't know yeah. that. That's it's, dark. it's really yeah. sad. And and Bernard Lee wasn't even driving that car. So it was more of a freak act. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Desmond Llewellyn ended up seeing the horse's ass <laughs> and the dart gun <laughs> before he... It is kind of darkly ironic that a man whose entire on-screen image was about auto safety would pass yeah. away in a car. It was about auto safety and how cars have guns on them. And pr please try to protect this car ends up in a tragic car accident, which is really sad. And it's bizarre in a... Fortuitous turn of events. This is the very last scene we see Desmond Llewellyn as Q. Is descending to hell. Yeah. Now, as we've joked about in the past, they're lowering him into his grave. Oh, yeah, he's here with me. We're having a party. I had never seen the scene in full, so I didn't realize that, like, he's just lowering out of yeah. front. You don't see where no. he's going. I'm like, he could easily just be, like, miming, like, going downstairs <laughs> or something. Exactly. Like, or he's about to blow a uh, uh, bond. Well, that's, that's, that's very possible. So smooth. So warm. It's like how we joked in the Diamonds Are Forever episode. He's, he's being lowered to the casino because he has a gambling addiction. <laughs> or maybe it's, right. like, the prestige, and he has, like, Christian Bale waiting down there to, like, break his legs or yeah, something. Yeah, there's clones of Desmond <laughs> Llewellyn, John Cleese is the younger yeah, guy. There's a water tank where he's going to drown himself. I love the line of... Remember, I always taught you two things, 007. One, never let them see you bleed. And the second, always have an escape plan. I just love seeing Desmond Llewellyn go, never let them see you bleed. Yeah, no, Paul and I were talking about this earlier because yeah. it's strange. <laughs> well, it's hilarious because what, when did Q ever impart that kind of advice? James Bond bleeds and never knows how he's going to get out of situations. Constantly. Yeah, no, look, it's, this is the weird thing is that like... Nothing about it makes sense. Yeah, one, Bond bleeds all the time, especially Pierce Brosnan's Bond. As the action scenes get more intense, he's bloody throughout a significant portion of it. Two, why would Q ever give him that advice? He's the quartermaster who says, don't fuck up my yeah. gadgets. Not like, 
Never let them see you bleed. Never let them see that you're human. He, yeah, he's not Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> like, no. I don't know about you guys, but I don't trust something that bleeds that much and doesn't die. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Pierce can't be human. <laughs> Pierce can't be human. Maybe uh, th 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 that would have also been like a, <laughs> like a good. I have always taught you two things, 007. Number one, you'll bleed once a month out of your vagina. Number two, <laughs> always have an escape plan. <laughs> No, always have a tampon. Always, always have a yeah. tampon. Yeah. And then he just hands him a tampon. <laughs> yeah. It's like... <laughs> now look closely, 007. <laughs> now pay attention, 007. Hey, this is an exploding ta- You queef and it explodes inside oh of you. Oh my god. <laughs> ex ex be very careful, 007. This will only be useful if you ever go up against a woman as your main villain. But that would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, you're, if you're ever sitting at a long table with a tube under the table, lined up precisely <laughs> at your crotch, you would be able to shoot somebody and kill them. Which is <laughs> weird, but it has happened before, 007. You know it has happened before. Now I see, like, uh, uh, we were watching Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and there's a scene in that where, like, a lady puts ping pong balls off her cooch and, like, shoots them like a missile. I'm just picturing Pierce Brosnan doing that <laughs> with, like, an exploding tampon. <laughs> Pierce should, really should have been in, in Priscilla. That would have been... And then John Cleese is demonstrating how to do it. He pulls down his pants, <laughs> just like, like thus. <laughs> I love the QR dynamic. I will say this, I know. I don't. I, I love having John Cleese and Desmond Llewellyn bouncing off each other. It's so much fun. It's nice that um, after after having all these movies where it's like, is Q his friend? Are they shitting on each other? Is he trying to kill him with these gadgets <laughs> over and over again? Now it's like, we have a steady dynamic. They just have to find a third guy to make fun of together. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, that's great. When they're both ragging on Cleese. The ragging on Cleese. At the same time, that doesn't set up R to actually be the successor because he's like the, uh, more of a clown. He's doing Pratt Falls, which Q never did. Well, at Die Another Day, he's a completely different character where John Cleese is just basically doing Desmond Llewellyn. Yeah. What, 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 makes, me, what makes me laugh about this scene is that Q, who's like 95, is like, oh, 007, meet, meet, like, meet my young new apprentice, and it's a 65-year-old man. I want to introduce you to the young fellow. I'm grooming to follow me. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> great. Yeah, no, that's, I that's what's that. even funnier. He's like, meet the young lad who's going to be my successor. My thing with John <laughs> Place is that uh, he was one of the funniest men throughout the 70s and 80s. And then come the 90s, he just lost the funny. He, he was never <laughs> funny again. That's what makes him great here. He loops back to being a Leslie Nielsen. Yeah, like when when the ball thing surrounds him and he's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm like, this is, this is not funny. <laughs> I laughed. I'm not ashamed to say I, I kind of laughed at that. I laughed even more because this is more demonstration of how Desmond Llewellyn tortures his assistants <laughs> working for him. He puts them into couches. He gets them trapped inside a giant protective uh, balloon yeah. balls inside of a coat. He's killed so many people. I love when they go full Muppet with it. And this scene, I would say, is much better than the scene in Octopussy where they had the new money penny. Y yeah. Uh, well, yes, that is true. But good, good Q scene in general. Could do without John Cleese, but I like Q imparting strange wisdom and then dying. Yeah. And well, here's the one thing that really cements like the relationship between Bond and Q. Because uh, after John Cleese gets caught in the giant ball, Bond goes like, well, you're not retiring soon, are you? You're not retiring anytime soon, are you? And the way he says that is just, there's so much yeah. love in the way he says it. But, Jake is crying. Like, it really Jake does. <laughs> no, it, it, it does kind of get me teary-eyed. It's like the mo the best unintentional like goodbye to this character because it's like as much as these guys ragged on each other uh, throughout the last 30, 40 years, uh, <laughs> they, th there, is a, there is a bond that they share yeah, with each other. Yeah, a James other. Bond. There's like a... <laughs> No, a Samantha Bond. What are you talking about? I prefer to think that Q hates Bond. I don't think he really hates <laughs> Bond. He's just Chrissy. That's why that's why you like him. Yeah, no. That's the only thing that I have to cling on to with these movies is Desmond Llewellyn 
consistently hating James Bond. I, I don't know. Well, I predict that there's going to be a movie in the future called uh, The Holdovers. And it's very much like that kind of relationship where it's just like it's a curmudgeonly teacher and this rambunctious rebel of a student. And they have this understanding of each other. They're, they come to have this yeah, I wish I wish the holdovers had ended with him being like, I always told you never to let them see you bleed. And he's like, You never <laughs> said that. When did you say that? A AMC theaters should lock up a bunch of people in in a screening of a compilation of all the Q James Bond scenes. Oh yes. Christ, that's me right now. <laughs> that's YouTube in the future. They just lock you in a room and they force you to watch Super Which Touch. is why you need to subscribe to Nebula. Yeah, subscribe. Yeah, subscribe. All of the stars are here at Nebula. We got that guy. We got that lady. We got that animated guy. Don't forget guy. that other guy. Oh, I love that guy with the glass. Oh, God. <laughs> all no, all no. the stars are here. Has H. Palmer guy confirmed if they're plagiarists or not? He's working on the lawsuit. He's working on the class action lawsuit. <laughs> yes. Uh, we're slightly concerned about it. Here <laughs> yeah. <Nebula. laughs> here you'll only listen twice. We, we're we're waiting for that H. Palmer guy <laughs> lawsuit any day See, now. See, we, we can never be accused of plagiarizing because we've never communicated a complete thought. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like, but yes, our, our podcast is so bad and incoherent that you could never accuse us of <laughs> plagiarism. <laughs> plagiarizing. Yeah, no, exactly. But let's move on from okay, Q. So they explain that there's a guy that has a bullet in his head. Roger Ebert loved this scene. Roger Ebert was like, holy crap, he has a holographic head. Well, I think this is probably Brosnan's last outing as James Bond. And obviously the person who should play James Bond is Mel Gibson. Well, I thought this movie was actually quite bad, Roger. And I'm going to tell you why. No, no, no. G well, now I'm just doing my Siskel and Ebert <laughs> routine. Yeah, so Renard is an uh, ex-Soviet KGB agent who's turned rogue and is fucking shit up, and he previously kidnapped Electra King, and an MI6 agent shot him in the head, and now he can't feel anything, so. And the bullet is slowly killing him, but as it kills him, he becomes even stronger! And explain this to me, Jake. It Somehow it sure. makes him stronger every yes. day. It's because he can't feel anything, so he doesn't know when he's pulling a muscle or when his body is like, or his bones are breaking when he's doing the doctor shit. lady says he is becoming stronger every day until he dies. And I'm like, that makes zero, <laughs> zero sense. As a guy who loved the 2014 film, Lucy, this makes perfect sense to me. And I'm on board with oh, this. Nonsense. Uh, real quick that Renard is played by Robert Carlyle. Yeah, Mr. Train Spotting. You fucking <laughs> You stopped this in a lava! Scotland! Yeah. Yes, he's from that. He was Rumpelstiltskin <laughs> in Once Upon a Time. And speaking of Danny Boyle, yes. he was John Lennon in Yesterday. Well, in Train Spotting. <laughs> He's in train. Oh, is he also John Lennon in Train Spotting? Yeah. Anyway, Melissa, you were uh, saying. <laughs> what was I saying? Uh, it's a pity that we only have the movie yesterday because Danny Boyle couldn't direct a Bond movie. I mean, it's one of the worst things that he's ever done. That's that's his like depression movie. That like I'm depressed yeah. that they fired me from James Bond, so now I'm gonna make this lazy, boring, unfunny rom-com. I'm going to waste Lily James like every other movie that's cast her. Mm. Uh -huh. Not, not Mamma yeah. Mia 2. Everybody screamed when I kissed the teacher. No, oh, yeah. I will give Mamma Mia to that it does use Lily James appropriately. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, and I would also argue a waste of Robert Carlyle. He's a tremendous actor. Did you know in Once Upon a Time, he not only played Rumpelstiltskin in The Beast, but he was also the crocodile from Peter Pan? I don't watch that shit. Neither did I. I'm a woman, I'm not an idiot. I'm, I, I'm actually, I'm really angry that they keep casting these famous Robert Carlyle types as Rumpelstiltskin when there's plenty of Rumpelstiltskin looking people like me that could just as easily play that role. I don't think you know what Rumpelstiltskin looks like. Then he just uh, this Can't like looking at pictures of Christoph Waltz <laughs> and just being like Rumpelstiltskin. Well, no, isn't he this like uh, a <laughs> that's wormy, like disgusting little creature? Yeah, but he has like a raggedy ass face and he's got a big beard. 
and he's like hopping around. So we're all in agreement then. Robert Carlyle, he's 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 fun in this. Yeah, he was in Train Spotting before. He's the best character. He's pretty fun. He yeah. can't hold a fucking candle to Elliot Carver, our homeboy. Yeah, I but. do. Yeah, see, that's the thing with Renard is apparently going into this, they marketed it him as the main villain. And yes. in order to ensure the misdirect, he still is kind of given main villain status. And in that respect, they called him Benjamin Harris. No, uh, no. John Harrison. Yeah. John, John Harrison. Harrison. <laughs> well, they 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 did do that with Christopher Waltz and Spectre, which fucking sucked. It sucked ass, but we'll get to that. That's a we'll later episode. We'll get to that. But in this movie, I do think sometimes I feel, and I like this movie more than everyone else, it sounds like, but the energy does sometimes dip when it's just him. Like he's giving a good performance, but the character is basically a glorified odd job. I think it dips whenever he's not on screen. <laughs> Incorrect. I like his presence. Uh, it, and yeah, it is kind of fun how he's, uh, how the twist is, is that he's Bane. <laughs> yeah, it's the Dark Knight Rises. Yeah. yeah, exactly. He's also a better foil to James Bond than Elektra is, so. I agree. No, cause, uh, just because he can fight. No, ex explain, explain. Let me see if I agree. Uh, you already did. Uh <laughs> Gotcha. gotcha. We see that he's a man who uh, cannot feel, literally cannot feel things, right? His nerve endings are fucked mm. up after being shot in the head. All the while, James Bond is finally starting to feel again. You know, he's fighting feelings for Elektra after being, um, you know, an unfeeling bastard sex machine womanizer for so yes. long. Hell yeah. He actually gives a shit about somebody, right? Um, and so that's. I don't know. That's how he's a good foil, right? Electra, she's just the love interest, right? And oh, she's I... bad news at the end of the day. But I think Robert Carlyle actually has something to do with James Bond as a character. But Electra King has the whole relationship with M that I would say is the actual like foil relationship. It's the fulcrum. But it's so like s just suggested. Like, how is it's... it suggested? They talk about it so much. It's something that they've done better in other Bond exactly, movies, like, like I, the relationship I, with M. My problem with this is kind of the problem that I have um, with like The Living Daylights, where like it's a good proto movie for something that they would do later with the Craig tenure, but it's still just like timidly approaching it. And it yeah, because they never because right when the relationship is consummated, they immediately forget about it because we need to get back to the plot because the entire it's time a poorly developed. Really yeah, no, too. it's it's a great idea because, you know, Bond has been womanizing everybody, but then he meets this one person who is just as fucked up and desensitized to everything and is living her life to the fullest, carefree of danger, carefree of how much money she spends because she was kidnapped and Bond, it is kind of funny where it's just like this. These are the key ingredients that will make Bond fall for you. Just like, wow, she really understands me. She's all messed up, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like, yeah, she get this yeah. is the only person that I could talk about, like gambling and having sex and would understand. And that main idea is interesting enough. However, yeah. they don't really have. Anything outside of these early suggestions because... No, it's all half-baked. Well, it, here's where I I think it's kind of interesting, and I have no idea how much we're, we're sticking to the plot in discussing these turns. What I think is interesting about this movie with Electric King is you're right. They stopped developing it at the middle because mm -hmm. in James Bond's mind, the, the second he realizes he's working with Renard, he just hates her guts. Like, yeah, he has no exactly. love yeah. for her anymore. Like, that dies. There's no conflict in him shooting her other no. than, like, what, like, at the end, he's just like, I need to stop her. I need to figure out what the hell yes. is going on. Every, she needs to be arrested. There's no conflict in that. I would like more betrayal. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's what's interesting about Pierce Brosnan is with Daniel Craig. I feel you would read the betrayal of, like, oh, no, I loved her. Well, you do in Casino Royale. Yeah, in Casino Royale, it's much better. Yeah, yeah, in Casino Royale, like, it's a one-to-one -one comparison. But with Pierce Brosnan, and again, that's why I always find his bond the most morally ambiguous bankrupt is no mm. he's like oh she bad actually and i will kill her one day if i have to and i will and it's like jesus dude and that's why i think you'd talk about the m relationship and i i think it's better in other movies like skyfall and whatnot right but 
if you want to argue that this is about building that M relationship, sure, right? Because it's sort of like he doesn't question that it's just Electra who's a bad person, and so he has no qualms about killing her in the end, right? But he never questions what a bitch M was to let this poor woman suffer. He does a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's more explored in Skyfall, definitely. What a bitch M is. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if M is really at fault in this movie. That's kind of an ambiguous question. I think she is. Well, she's the she's the head of like the the the, yeah. the secret service of like one of the worst countries ever. <laughs> okay, but again, we're analyzing it through the the lens of James Bond. Yeah, no, so I know, like, but like this they, movie doesn't analyze that the MI six is a bankrupt. No, no, system. no, but like in this one, they do. Yeah, they do present what like, she did to Electra is indisputably. They bad. do present like a side of them that's more uh, like even James Bond goes like Jesus. You did that, you know? <laughs> right. But ultimately, he sides with her. You it's know? a lot like Alec Trevelyan. Trevelyan. Right? Where, like, they were like, not our finest moment, but this guy sucks. And this movie kind of does the same thing where it's like, not our finest moment. Oh, but she was in on it and she cut off her own ear. And really, she was bossing around Renard, not him oh. bossing her well, around. And it's oh. all because M told Robert King to pay them off is the main thing yeah. as to why she snaps. Uh, yeah. There's this whole thing about you use me as bait, but I'm, I'm, well, maybe I'm just not paying attention, but I'm kind of <laughs> like, is that what happened? Like, is that like a- That's the thing with know? the movie is they kind of have it both ways where is Electra a victim yeah. or is she a manipulator or is she both? They want to call it Stockholm Syndrome, which I think is pretty weak. Well, yeah, solution. that's just James Bond's yeah. first impression of the well, situation. Well, it was funny when they're like, you don't understand, you have Stockholm yeah. Syndrome, and I'm like- Gaslighting her. Well, I've been <laughs> watching these movies for months <laughs> We now. have Stockholm don't Syndrome. Don't tell me yeah. about it. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, God. No, I mean, again, I don't know if we want to cut to that scene right away, but that's such a Benoit Blanc. It reminded me of a scene, Benoit? hypothetically- and the upcoming No Time to Die, <laughs> where Daniel Craig is interrogating Blofeld and he's like slipping in the Benoit Blanc. I felt Pierce Brosnan slipped ben in the Benoit, Benoit Blanc in that scene. Ben where like, it's called Benoit. Stockholm Syndrome. You knew just where my arm was. Like, he's so sassy in that Who scene. Who the fuck is Benoit Blanc? Wait, I'm so. Wait, does Melissa not know who Benoit is? It's pronounced ben Benoit. Benoit. <laughs> Benoit. <laughs> yeah. This crime clashed. With the presence of Benoit Blanc. It's it's, pro it's pronounced beignet. Be beignet. Uh... Mm. Guys, I've never claimed to be French. Don't put that <laughs> on me. I proudly. <laughs> but they say the name so many times. It's... I'm not paying attention to those movies. It's, just, it's an easy name. It's two syllables. Benoit. Benoit. <laughs> And, and and you said and you and you keep calling Alec Trevelyan Alec Trevelyan. Whatever. It's Trevelyan. Well, that that one's <laughs> that one I'm also guilty of. Troy, are you the Rich Evans of this group? Yes. 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 Thousand percent. Yes. Electra is she? We, we find all these dark secrets. She's introduced as like I'm I'm a, a pipeline builder, but for yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's <laughs> uh, she's sparing this old like Slavic town from the pipeline. She's like, we're building a pipeline, but not directly through the church. And the villagers cheer. We are, and they're all holding Hungarian flags, even though they're in Azerbaijan. Uh, I'm, even though they're in that country, I can't pronounce. Azerbaijan. Exactly. No, you, you were doing it right this time. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, you guys made well. me self-conscious. Why is the movie telling me that Kazakhstan is in Central Asia? Because this was before Borat. There's no Kazakhstan in this movie. Yeah, there is. Yeah, Kazakhstan is when they get when they steal the That's bomb. That's Christmas Jones. Yeah, Christmas oh, Jones in right. Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan is in Central Asia. Yeah, it is in Central Asia. Yeah, I'm aware, which is why I don't know why I need a Chiron. Because this was that. before Borat. Oh. It was before so? people knew what Kazakhstan was. Can I do a hot take? Chirons in movies always annoy me. Like, I always feel a little bit insulted. They're always like, you're in a new setting. And I'm like, yeah, I know, I have eyes. Yeah, and you really don't like uh, the Russo brothers doing the big Oh yeah, the full screen Chiron. <laughs> Berlin! One of, one of the most insufferable trends in recent films, I gotta say. Uh, but yeah, this I would say this is the most uh, anti-communist James Bond movie so far. Wow, that's really saying something. <laughs> How? Well, is, isn't Renoir like a former like Soviet agent of sorts? Well, they say he worked for everyone. He was like a terrorist 
for hire. He was basically a Russian James Bond who got cut loose and now he's just like... uh, Isn't there, in Scotland, don't they have a thing where it's like, since leaving the KGB, he's been seen in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, all these countries, and then James Bond is like, lovely vacation places, am I right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) There's like a bunch of little digs. But like Electra, when she's building a pipeline, she's like the communist like ravage and, and James Bond's like drinking like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, it's so, I don't know, it's just so interesting to me that the movies got like more anti-communist like after the Soviet Union fell, but while the Soviet Union was up, like Gogol was like jumps with him. <laughs> like, well, it's very weird because every James Bond movie has to make the argument that their bad guy is the most unique villain ever. So when he was fighting the communists, he was an anti-communist. And when he was fighting corrupt capitalist business people, he's very pro-capitalism. Like, it's just so important that you know that these people do not represent the ideology. (laughs) It's classic movie logic. Like, the bad guys, it's always better to have bad guys from the past, where it's settled, it's not controversial, (laughs) you know. But there are still communist countries. Right, and the heroes are the brave, uh... (laughs) <laughs> Mujahideen fighters. Yeah. <laughs> Until it's not okay to say that. This movie kind of has an interesting complex, an Electra complex, if you will. Well, that's the weird thing. They say she has an inverted Electra complex, which is an Oedipus complex because she wanted to kill her dad to avenge her mom. Because yeah. in her mind, her dad took her mom's... Right. Uh, Oil, even though in the script it says that her mom's dad gave her dad the oil. So mm-hmm. it, it's this weird kind of fighting against the patriarchy, and she's come against the ultimate patriarchy, which is J- James Bond. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's the ultimate patriarch. It's like I'm 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 doing a girl boss by building a pipeline. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like... This is my fight song. This is my this fight is my song. song. Oh my god, someone needs to do a fan cam of Electric King with fights. <laughs> yeah, I know. Aww. That's the new clip. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, it's like girl bosses don't lock other girl bosses in the dungeon in Turkey. <laughs> 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 speaking, sp- speaking of that other, the, the 95-year-old uh, girl boss that will still be in like five other <laughs> movies. <laughs> I love Judy Dench as him. This movie started one of my least favorite trends that the Bond movies have here on out. It's not too egregious here, but then they just kept doing that. And it's M being out on the field. Like, she's yeah. always fucking on them. And it's like, you are 90, you are not a field agent. Like, you're a bureaucrat. Yeah, well, it it goes into the, well, the later Daniel Craig movies kind of use the MI6 supporting characters as if they're IMF agents in Mission Impossible, where they're always out on the field. Ray Fiennes holding a fucking gun? Like, what? Yeah, like, no, because <laughs> every single mission during, like, Daniel Craig's thing. It's like, this is the most important mission ever. We need all hands on deck. Yeah. And you'd only do get away with that so many times. It's like his MI6 family. And it's like, get the yeah. fuck out of here. It's like, it's about family. And that's what's so powerful about it. Yeah, no. And it's just like, but the James Bond movies are not about that. <laughs> it's not about like, it's, it's not Mission Impossible. Well, you know what the issue was is when you start casting Ray Fiennes and Judy Dench as your M, you want to use them more as opposed to right. when you're casting a guy who's barely sober enough you, we should cast another <laughs> drunk. Get another yes. drunk supporting guy who's like. I I should be the next M. Just give me a a bottle of scotch. I haven't M. seen Jan stand up in weeks. Just because Jan watched Sideways recently again, he thinks he's an alcoholic now. <laughs> <laughs> he's a wino. Yes. It's like aspirational. I'm a wine connoisseur. I'm not an alcoholic. No. Um, but I, my lips are dry. I have to go for some wine. Uh, again, we're like, what, 40 minutes into the movie. Uh, and Okay, okay. We'll speed uh, run. We got to speed run the plot here. You we get the Bond and Electric King bonding. They do a ski slope, like on Her Majesty's Secret Service. She's dressed like Tracy. She's dressed like Tracy. She asks Bond, have you ever lost someone close to you, Mr. Bond? And we just hold. And that's the closest... The Brosnan era. That's arguably our last reference to Tracy. Yes. Or is it Terry Hatcher? Yeah, we were debating this. Is this the same Bond that had Tracy or when they're talking about like 
Bond's lost love, are they talking about Terry Hatcher? And this is a completely different Bond. Oh, I thought you were going to say, are they talking about Felix's leg? <laughs> <laughs> no, Felix's wife and his leg. Oh, no. I miss Jack Wade now. I miss Felix. When she's like, have you ever lost a loved one, Mr. Bond? He's just picturing Q descending into hell. <laughs> <laughs> I would argue, I, I, we did talk from a stylistic standpoint. I think the Brosnan era is kind of a reboot, but I think Die yeah. Another Day somewhat implies that it's all the same guy. Yeah. Because well, because it has all the gadgets, but I see that more just as a wink, not really yeah. like. Die Another Day could go either way because we'll talk about it next episode, but there were plans to have the code name theory confirmed in Die Another Day, but then they cut it. Which would have made absolutely no sense. Yeah. It would have made absolutely no yeah, sense. Yeah, it would have been dumb. Just, it just accept it. It's a floating timeline. Two yeah. ages in real time. Bond yeah. is immortal. Money Penny is immortal. Bond may age a few years, but then he'll get younger by the next movie, so it's all good. <laughs> yes, he'll circle back around. Can I interject? Since I will not be joining you for from the afterlife. We'll drown out this dialogue. For <laughs> die another day. Can I just say what a stupid and dated and wonderful Bond song. That's all I've got to say. Oh, yeah. I like it more it's than Tomorrow Never Dies. It's terrible and I love it. What? That's, that's wrong. Shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> I would rather but, listen to it. It's more fun, and it gets fun. me going. It's so fun. Uh, yeah. It's so fun. This is like something I would listen to at a club and start dancing. It's amazing. <laughs> we have sidetracked so much of this podcast into defending Tomorrow Never Dies, a song that Sheryl Crow hates. So what? Shirley Bassey hates Moonraker, and that's by far the best Shirley Bassey song. Again, wrong, Jay. That's wrong. Moonraker is her weakest song. It makes me feel nice. We got to get back to the movie because- Yes, please. I'm hungry. Okay, I want to note first the skiing. There's a bunch of action. I The one notable bit is when he sends this little- Like the little snowmobile? Yeah, a little snowmobile snow cat. We don't know the technical name. Uh, he goes off the cliff and, and Pierce is like, see you back at the lodge. Yes. And then they deploy a second parachute and he's like, shit. <laughs> and then he's got to ski back around off the cliff just to cut yes. their parachute, just to make sure they blow yeah. up in the right. fiery blaze. But I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it is about the, how the action is shot in this movie, but there was something about this that like, especially after coming from Di uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, I was just like, this action feels kind of bland. Like, I don't know. Well, here's my take on the action in the world is not enough, because I do agree the action is a step down from Tomorrow Never Dies. Tomorrow Never Dies was great at doing hand-to-hand, -hand, close quarters action. Even if there was something like the car, it was cramped, it was suspenseful. The world is not enough. It's all James Bond going up against giant vehicles or giant machines. Like, everything's larger than life, so it feels a little disconnected to me. It feels a little Looney Tunesy that it's like, oh, he's fighting snowmobiles with parachutes that are kind of flying, or, oh, he's going to fight a giant helicopter with a giant buzzsaw. Like, they're really creative, so I do enjoy them from that respect, but yeah. it does feel detached from reality. Well, in Smart Never Dies, it's like, the goons that he fights, we all know that they're working for Elliot Carver, so they're just extensions of Elliot Carver. Mm -hmm. Here we're 30 minutes into the movie and he's just fighting nameless goons of a villain that we haven't met yet. <laughs> you know, but we think and, it's Renard. The movie doesn't yeah. want us to think it's Renard. It wants us to think of Renard, but we haven't met Renard yet. So we don't have an opinion of him in the, in Tomorrow Never Dies right off the bat. Elliot Carver is like planning to blackmail the president and he's wacky and we hate him. <laughs> you know? We love him. That's as we were talking about in Goldfinger. It's always better when the villains there from the beginning. Because right. then you get to see Bond and in playoff. And to be fair, I think this movie does, since they moved the credit sequence back, um, you would argue the movie does do that with Electra King. But then she still disappears for a bit because they're trying to maintain the illusion. So right. yeah. it's one of those things of juggling the Bond girl and the villain being the same. And person. for the next couple bits, it's it's all about like misdirecting because bond you're concerned about bond fighting over his feelings about how he's falling in love i never buy that that bond falls in love with Electra in this movie yeah i mean it's, it's so half-baked see this is my hot take i don't think the movie hinges that much on you thinking bond could fall in love with Electra, but at least that he cares about her yeah i think it hinges on the idea that he could have fallen in love 
with her more than that he is in love with her. I don't her. think that but this movie's that smart. <laughs> well, that's what I meant about the foil thing with Renar, right? It's just that he has feelings. Yeah, every time I'm like, the movie is doing something, Chan's like, it's not smart enough to do that thing, but it is doing that thing. So but clearly they're smart enough to at least do well, that Well, here's the, here's the difference is that it, it, it attempts to do it. I still end up feeling cold about like, the main thing because there isn't like that like what if this could have worked you're not mourning the possibility of their relationship really before you even have enough time to even process what's going on she's yeah. bad or there's suspicions that she's bad or bond is distracted with well, stopping I a mean, bomb the only thing that's different is like oh she likes to gamble she has a couple of lines about we gotta live for today and it, it, no like, there's no point in living if you can't feel the life like, there's not that much there, you know? Well, like, I mean, uh, going back to the whole issue, I kind of feel with the Brosnan, and it, I feel Dalton kind of had this bit with Brosnan, is it's like, how much of the fact are we building off the fact that these movies are now referring to the character having a long history, which I guess kind of plays into, yeah, if this was a standalone movie by itself, it would seem a little thin. But if you're looking at the Bond character... It seems Finn with 40 years of movies. No, because then you're like, this yeah. is the first time this has ever happened, and you're like analyzing how is Bond emotionally like responding to this. I think, I think my main problem with this movie is that the execution of, of the movie is like trying to give priority to all the character stuff over the action. But the movie yeah. itself, like the screenplay clearly is always choosing to give priority to the action over the mm. character work. So the character work never really gets to shine and the action's kind of bland, <laughs> you know? So, well, yeah. they try to have their cake and eat it too. I would disagree because I feel the Michael Apted kind of downplayed the action so much because you get stuff like the casino scene, which I think is where we're at. And that's all character stuff. Well, that, that's that's pretty much the extent of the character stuff. Which is even more bizarre because we are reintroduced to Robbie Coltrane as Valentine. He's and back. Valentine, as we remember, is an ex-KGB agent who's turned mafia boss who hates James Bond because he crippled him. But he doesn't hate him. He hates him like Q hates him. No, no, no. He fucking hates him in Goldeneye. In this movie, you would there he's just like, Bond, don't you ever say hello? What is up with you trying? to kill me all the time chillax bond <laughs> i like how bond oh where the way pierce like humiliates his henchmen is like brutal he's so great in this i was when we were watching it i was like i don't know how to describe this but this whatever i'm seeing right now hagrid with a machine gun that's my personality <laughs> like, oh yeah <laughs> we should normalize whatever that is you you felt represented yeah. The Brosnan era doesn't have Felix Leiter, but I love how they bring back Jack Wade and uh, Karet Varensky, Karet Valentine. Yeah, well, it's Valentine. It's, Valentine. it's like trying to give the Brosnan era its own little continuity without going like full, full stupid, <laughs> like with the Craig movies. Yeah, they're like full, like everything is connected. Sometimes I feel like it's like we paved a road. Well, this is like trying to pave a road. And I'm like, but they did it. It's here. It's it's right there. I mean, it, it's not real. But yeah, it is. It's like he's coming back. And right, it's a Paul, continuity. You, you were saying, Paul. I noted in the casino, it's shocking it took this long, I guess, because they couldn't do the effects well oh, enough. Yeah. But every boy's dream, he got x-ray glasses. Yeah. And he can see who's got guns. Yeah, he's wearing Orson Welles' x-ray glasses from Casino right It's now. the most spy shit ever. That, that is Spy Kids tier level gadget. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and it does, I don't know how they quite, how they, but the, the look with the color, and it, it's like, it's almost heat vision, but not really, which is Yeah, cool. it looks pretty good. Um, anyway, so so if you ever see, and aren't the lenses like blue? Yeah, they're something? like purple blue. They're probably purple. So if you ever see Pierce with, with purple shades at night. And he's looking at your looking junk. At you, you, should, <laughs> <laughs> you should be careful. You're being complimented. That's like half of Mamma Mia. <laughs> it's him just like <laughs> oogling 60 year olds with his sunglasses. Colin Firth is like, oh my. <laughs> yeah, okay. So they meet, they romance. We, we kind of already just talked about well, this. Wait, can we talk? Wait, wait, wait. What's going on with the card game they play in the casino? It's just like, guess the highest number. Yeah, yeah I'm like, I put a million dollars on this card. <laughs> It's to show how reckless Electra is because she's willing to spend a million dollars on like a extremely difficult game of chance 
And Bond is really turned on by this <laughs> because she's like, oh, yeah. and, but then you find out later on that this was not actually a card game. This was a very specific business transaction between Electra and Valentine because she needed Valentine to get like naval equipment. Oh, the submarine. Or oh, is that what that was about? <laughs> yeah, was I that no it? I completely missed that. I had no idea. I love this movie. I've seen it twice. I have no, no idea. Yeah, no, you find out that this was totally planned. It has nothing to do with her being reckless. I mean, it is, but in a different way. She's actually paying him off because she needs a it's nuclear submarine. It's a calculated submarine. Yeah. decision. Yeah. Exactly. Interesting. And then they have sexy sex. One note about the About the sex. Jake, can you tell me... Did I miss something, or was it always there? When did he get that scar on his lip? Bond? His lip? What? Pierce Brosnan. He's got a big scar on his lip what? right here. Uh, like, it's very, very visible yeah, throughout Yeah, I think the movie. I know what you're yeah. talking about. I didn't see it. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I like how in the sex scene, it's basically been like, what's going on with Pierce Brosnan's lip? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I mean, you're scrutinizing him like, is he still a 10 out of 10? He is. He oh, is. oh <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? Absolutely. I ne I've never seen this before. Scars are extra points. Sorry, I was watching the Blu-ray. I mean, yeah. He still looks <laughs> great. No, I'll, I'm going to go the opposite. This scar has ruined Pierce Brosnan for me. He is an what? ugly man. Deeply yeah. disturbed. You and, you yeah, and your hot there. takes. <laughs> Tro Troy is trying to be different. <laughs> He's trying to get into the feminist club, but we're, we're not going to let him, right, Paul? <laughs> hey, I was joking. I would never diss a man born north of Dublin. So while they were shooting this, Pierce Brosnan apparently was in charge of like making sure Sophie Marceau's arms covered herself to make sure they kept the PG-13 rating. And every time, like, they did it, he would go, oh, there goes our PG-13 rating. <laughs> it's definitely some complicated. I mean, look, you got to give her points uh, for the performance just because I'm like, there's a lot of choreography. <laughs> They're going all over the bed. Because she's because she's walking all around yeah. the room and, you know. Not realistic, you know. And he's spinning her, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Is this the first attempt by a Bond movie to do a sex, like an extended sex scene in one of the main films? Because Never Say Never Again. No, because well. this is like the same kind of thing that they've done before, because the sex scenes are usually like post coitus. Like you see either leading up to coitus or post coitus. And right. this is more. I sustain thing. we have to see close up penis to vagina penetration for this movie to be successful again. I really thought having your wife on the podcast would change. <laughs> would would Jan. would would calm Jan, what Have I not brought this up? Is your pitch just um, the the bit from "It's Always Sunny"? Yes, the, where... he knows the truth. <laughs> <laughs> because what's the one major thing missing from all action movies these days, guys? Full penetration. <laughs> where it's just like, here's the thing: we, we show, show it. it. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> Wait, Melissa, you were you were trying to say something. What, uh, what were you trying to say about this? I was just giving the feminine perspective about her clothes. They probably added body tape, which can hold things to the skin, mm -hmm. um, you know, without tearing at the skin, right? Without being uncomfortable. I imagine there was some amount of body tape involved. Not really a worthwhile note, but I will say that as far as the costuming for Sophie Marceau goes, right? This is my feminist perspective. But uh, very nice costumes. Like, she looks excellent. Like, the way she's dressed, very well appointed, like, perfect for the character. Very uh, sophisticated. The robes are just 10 oh, out of yeah. 10 super. The robes are fantastic. Uh, honestly, like, this is coming from a straight woman, right? Like, but even just having bed sheets around her, I was like, just put her in another one of those, like, robes. It's fantastic. But then, of course, you'd be covering her up. A lot more so that's not really what the people want um but i just have to say props to the uh costume designer for this i don't know their name but they did an excellent job with with sophie it was lundy hemming right yeah but excellent job okay she just like it's not just that sophie Merce is beautiful it's just that like the clothes are great for her character all right now let's get rid of her character for a bit and go meet someone else yeah, we got to go to Kazakhstan <laughs> and Pierce has to talk his way onto a plane full of bald men in jumpsuits. He blends right in. This really is like the rightful successor to On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Because yep. We're starting to build an interesting relationship. And then the movie's like, well, enough <laughs> of that. 
Here's an hour of just like random like cringe. <laughs> well, to be fair, Honor Managed Secret Service does devote a montage into setting up how they're dating. They're they're in love. Yeah. Look how much they're in love with each other. This has one sex scene. <laughs> yeah, the Honor Managed Secret Service has something like a semblance of something. <laughs> Again, that runs into the debate of is the movie more about them being in love or is it more about the betrayal? And I feel the movie was more about the betrayal. But we don't see him really feeling betrayed. Yeah, we do. He's yelling all the time. A Brosnan. Well, do, are, do we want to get into this now? The biggest problem for me is that he is like, wait a minute, you're bad. And, that, and she's like, no, I'm not. And then for like 20 or 30 minutes, you're, you're like, it, uh, what am I supposed to be thinking? Right. And then she's like, and I'm bad. Yeah. Well, there's <laughs> no doubt about it. Like uh, Bond doesn't doubt it for a second. And I feel like that's the problem. No, yeah, I I, but that's what I like about it is he's like the one lone man who knows the truth. Well, yeah, Bond, Bond doesn't doubt it, but he just kind of, Shrugs it off. He's like, well, nobody believes well, me. Well, no. she's just hanging out with him. But he's yelling at him. And you're kind of like, is this supposed to be scary when she's in the room with yeah. him? Like, that should be tense, right? But I don't know. It doesn't quite Well, read. it feels like the movie's still trying to make you go like, is she? Isn't she? Is there's Bond no tension wrong? to Bond about that? Yeah, it, but yeah. it doesn't really feel like there's any tension because it's no, like like it should not. be palpable that whole bit where Bond is away and he knows that she's bad and she's in the room with yeah. everybody else. Right. Yeah. And but he's just kind of like, I look. She's probably gonna kidnap her. I've thought about this. We're completely you know? ignoring that it's like that scene leads to him getting out of there because he knows he needs to get out of there in order to foil her plan. So like the wheels are always turning with James Bond. But we Bond. don't know that that's Bond's plan until after the fact. But we just assume that James Bond should have a plan to foil her because he has been consistently suspicious of her. But he doesn't have a great track record with um, planning things. <laughs> He's the, the worst spy ever. <laughs> yes. Despite what Q has tried to teach him. Oh, well, she's terrible at it too. <laughs> yeah, but the reason why... He finds out about a lecture is because he goes to Kazakhstan, meets yeah. up with Christmas Jones, disguises himself as a Russian guy, yeah. meets up with Renard. And what did we set up earlier? That Electric King has a motto. There's no point living if you can't feel the life. And he's interrogating Renard. And Renard says the same thing to her. Mm -hmm. And this is the point where Bond goes like, wait, what? And also Renard knows that he has a shoulder injury yeah. and exploits mm -hmm. that Yeah. Uh, while they're stealing... Uh, the nuclear device from the old missile silo. Renard's kind of a dumbass. Well, he didn't <laughs> yeah, know he she is. would tell him the slogan. He's a sweetie pie. Yeah, I like him. But why even say this? No, that's the thing. Is like Renard. I like him because he looks like Blofeld, but like <laughs> Blofeld, like metal Blofeld. Yeah. Like if he was the lead of a metal band. Fuckable Blofeld. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, also he's also kind of like proto uh Matt's Mickelson in Casino Royale of like a Bond villain that is very scary but you also kind of is kind of like a pathetic bitch and you kind of feel bad I for I feel her. bad for him. He's the most I care about anyone in this. I enjoy the dynamic between Electric King and Renard where he's like yeah. this poor simp being treated yeah. as a doormat for her Yeah, he's a simp. That 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 scene where they're like uh him and Electra are like playing with clearly fake eyes yeah. is like really sad yeah. <laughs> what's even funnier is that she was able to convince him so he's this anarchistic terrorist who doesn't believe in any system of government yet she recruits him to be part of this very complicated oil scheme <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah hey it, it's great i would do anything for sophie Marceau. that's the thing they play it as like a patty hearst thing <laughs> where it's like if patty hearst became the leader of the symbionese liberation army yeah right yeah no that that's what's interesting about it it's 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 kind of like the bad guy from the secret of nim Two. oh yeah yes. oh yeah the little fat <laughs> mouse in the little blue shirt he gets a cape the fat mouse that turns into eric idol <laughs> yes and he gets a cape God. and he's all scraggly yeah um while we're in kazakhstan i do want to point out that we do have what i love about this movie is it has a lot of the best references to Bond, James Bond. We have Valentin introduced. Oh, Bond, James Bond. <laughs> it's you. And then we have the, yep. the gun shoot gas thing. My name's Bond. Did 
James Bond. He says it like with an American accent. He's like, the name's Bond. James Bond. James Bond. That's just so Pierce Brosnan sounds like when he yells. He kind of sounds American. Like, ah! Who are you going? Pierce Brosnan <laughs> moves to Brooklyn. As he gets angrier, he gets closer to Brooklyn. His, his Irish English accent just disappears and it just becomes yeah. Mario. It's a me, James Bond. Oh no, I know you use the pipe so well. That's, that, th th this might be my favorite Bond, James Bond. Yeah, it's great. They put a lot of emphasis on it. Because it's so unclassic. Denise Richards, like, yeah, we meet her in this scene. She's dressed as Lara Croft. Originally, her character was supposed to be a French Polynesian scientist, but then they were like, you already have one French lady in this. You can't have two. And then <laughs> they made her a bounty hunter, and then she we became- We need American representation. <laughs> yeah. She is fine. Yeah. When I hear people say that she's the worst Bond girl ever, ever, I'm like, you have not seen these movies. It's because they hate Denise Richards. Why? I guess she was just a, I mean, we were too young, but I guess she was just a punchline, like even before this. Movie, well, right? I think part of it is they have her saying some science stuff, and it's like a hot, supermodel scientist in a james bond movie and i'm like how yeah. dare you and it's just like yes this is this is nothing new what what the hell are no, you talking about and problem? she's a better actress than most of the hot supermodel scientists right. that this is more this is genuinely more convincing than when we see roger moore standing up in a view to a kill <laughs> i, I would agree with that. yeah up. like i buy her as being more in the world and to be fair to denise richards like okay it is a little weird christmas jones nuclear physicist yeah. it's a little like Okay. It's a little bit of a porn star. Uh, why did you, yeah, why did you write the woman like this? But the other woman who is in contention to play this role is Tiffany Thiessen from Saved by the Bell. So they were never going to cast like Judy Davis as like a nuclear physicist in this movie. That was never what the character was going to be. So it's not Denise Richards fault that this is how well, they yeah i mean it. it's a pun name one you know it's one of those ones yeah so. she needs to be smoking but yeah i mean the character's nothing but she's she's fine she's not sleepwalking yeah, through it yeah. she's saying her lines like with energy <laughs> you know she's just there to be the betty to electric king's veronica like they're like we need a wholesome yeah. nice one so so what do you think melissa about christmas jones and these Richards? <laughs> I'm the diversity hire. What do you think about the woman? Yes, um, you're uh, you're the affirmative action. <laughs> uh, no, but I don't have a lot of like thoughtful commentary on Christmas Jones. It was pretty cringe. Um, I, oh. but, like as far as the Bond <laughs> oh. series goes, when we have other characters like what Doctor Goodhead and shit like that, like not as offensive. Like it's a dumb name, right? Potentially a porn star name, but not like terribly offensive. Uh, yeah. Denise Richards' performance is fine. Again, I don't buy her as a scientist, but I'm not really sure that's her fault. I think that's uh, the costuming department's fault more than anything. And also, like, if this movies, these movies are not striving for. Reals. I know, like, there's so many other things to be upset about as a woman. Um, with with these <laughs> movies, I would not say that the world is like not... just Roger Moore in general. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with, it's already an improvement when we leave Sean Connery and Roger Moore behind. That there's nothing in the world is not enough that particularly boils my blood in in that way uh i mean and and it's not even just like misogynist things in and of themselves one of my favorite movies is fatal attraction which is horribly misogynist but it's super fun my problem is these movies aren't fun for me so i have to deal with mm. misogyny and a lack of fun uh but yeah christmas jones i don't find terribly problematic like the skimpy outfit aside i mean she's not horrible i just she's not really interesting her dynamic with uh bond i think is really underdeveloped like they end up fucking at the end but i was like what is that line that he said not before he says i have always wanted to have christmas in turkey they, they they say I think they say something to each other in the, that finale, um, and I'm like, he says, uh, "Gobble gobble, bitch, open up." <laughs> Here comes the stuffing. What's that? What's that movie where it's turkey time? Turkey gobble, time. Gobble. Turkey time. Yeah. Oh yeah. wait, it's thanks killing. Gobble gobble, motherfucker. Maybe Jake remembers the exact line. I but don't they, remember actually. They make a re some sort of reference to like, oh, I've been wanting this for a while. Not just the turkey thing, but like that they've been <laughs> wanting to, to smash. Is that a Christmas joke? For me? No. No. So isn't it time you unwrapped your present? 
And I'm like, you didn't develop that at all. Like there's been no chemistry. They, they had the caviar joke. Oh, too bad we don't have any champagne. <laughs> or sour cream. The, the turkey one, I don't know what it is about it, but that is the pun that's made me the most uncomfortable in any of these movies. <laughs> okay. It doesn't really make sense. Oh wait, they do have one good piece of banter when they first meet. I do like when she's like, named Christmas Jones and don't do it. I've heard all the jokes. And he's like, right, I don't right. know any doctor jokes. And don't make any jokes, I've heard them all. I don't know any doctor jokes. And they look yeah. at each other. That's cute. Yeah. That's a pretty good one. But yeah, no, like their relationship is, it's virtually non-existent. It's just like- its It feels platonic to me. <laughs> no, extremely know? platonic. So it's so much of a shock when they're fucking at the end. Right? It just feels like perfunctory. Well, literally a warm body because that's all they see is that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so weird. Her. Wouldn't it have been better if they all just started fapping to that as the ending? You know, I know. Like, it's so weird. <laughs> what the hell, Melissa? Is that what you're doing in hell? <laughs> With Desmond, you and Desmond, Desmond just leans over. You know, they never let us fap during these sequences, Melissa. Melissa, you mentioned that leaving Roger Moore behind. And I was I was thinking to myself, we really left Roger Moore behind because Pierce has what's his face with the bullet. And he's like, I usually hate killing an unarmed man. Cold blooded murder is a filthy business. It's like, oh, same character, same character. But last movie, he killed someone who was unarmed. Of course he did. Exactly. He's killed plenty of people. Actually, Pierce Brosnan probably has the highest body count of any of the Bonds. Yeah, he's a monster. <laughs> We're talking about someone who slaps around unarmed women. <laughs> yeah, he's a monster. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. It's like, it's kind of shocking to me that they thought this late in the game to make a main, you know, female villain because it's the yeah. perfect excuse for Bond to beat women up. And that's like this <laughs> franchise's favorite thing. Right? Uh, we all remember yes. Bambi and Thumper, don't we? Well, it's not really about uh, Bond like slapping around, like not at all. It's about the villain coming in and killing Bond. So we have some second act motivation to get the bad guy. <laughs> that he does slap women around. <laughs> that's why you'll never be part of the feminist club like me and Paul Jake. Mm -hmm. That's right, your, your membership has just been revoked. Okay, another thing where I'm like, have they been watching these movies where it's like, how could you use someone as bait? And I'm like, this is how Bond operates. He shows up and waits to be attacked. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. He's the most passive protagonist of if all time. If we're at that scene where he's confronting Electra again he's going full Blanc and he's being like, my arm, how do you know? Sophie Marceau is giving such a great performance for me in that, where he's like, how did he say the same thing that you said? And she's like, you use me as bait? Like just changing the subject, like no, so she's, effortlessly. she's really good in that scene where where she's like completely like, what are you talking about? Wait, you used me as bait? You lied to me? Yeah. What? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Don't turn this on me, Mister. <laughs> it's great. I duck season, wabbit season, duck season, season wabbit, wabbit season. season. I say fire. I I hate when Electra kidnaps M, and then like we're in the movie, and then it's like a. Meanwhile, and then it's just like M sitting like, yeah, in, in a computer room. And then we come back to the movie. Yeah. It happens like three times. Like, meanwhile with M, and she's just sitting there. She's, she's and then like trying back. to knock over, and she's trying to get the clock. And she's like, eh. And then she knocks it over, and she's like, oh, fuck. And then they cut back to her, she's still there. <laughs> and, then, and then that scene ends. It's like a bit from Twin Peaks, The Return. It's just like, yeah. Yeah, it is. watching paint yeah. dry. It's like experimental cinema. I like how <laughs> M is called into the field now because James Bond just blew up his security detail. It's like, well, we gave you a job that we didn't want to give you and you didn't do it, so now I'm And here. then that shit doesn't even matter in the end, just to like skip ahead, right? But we, we have this scene of her you know, messing with the clock and then she gets the clock from Electra so that she can get the batteries. And then it just ends up not mattering. Like she gives her location to MI6, but then I don't know, like Bond just ends up busting her out. And anyway? well, that's how Bond, I think that's how Bond found where they are. Is it? This is how little I pay attention. Okay. I thought he found it independently. Yeah. Right? No, well, the, here's the funny thing is that she pings Bond and Valentin where she's being held at. Okay. And then. Valentine's uh, henchman Bull leaves a bomb behind, seemingly killing Valentine. Bond and Christmas escape, but then they're kidnapped by Electra's men and taken to the place anyway. Yeah, like it just felt. Thank you. This is why I need Jake to explain these things. Because, but like it, to <laughs> me, at least with my, he's the one that explains all this to us because we 
Like, we're, we're watching this and the plot just, like, flies over our heads. No, but even with how poorly communicated this movie is, I just felt like, yeah, it didn't matter what she did with the batteries. He broke her out independently, so it just the felt... The only thing that it kind of matters is that Valentine shows up because he knows where they're at. Even though his computer is, okay. like, fucked up from the explosion, he still has the location. The tube. We, we gotta talk about the tube, oh, Bob. The tube is, like, this movie dipping into... Die another day, yeah, a little bit, yeah. of like outrageous CGI, <laughs> but it's so fucking fun. Yeah, it's I love it's it. my other favorite action scene in this movie. This feels very Joe Dante Looney Tooney. It's remarkably well done, considering that it is like a hundred percent like green screen of them like sitting. It looks down. like it looks <laughs> like Garfield. <laughs> no, and they are unfrazzled. They are moving at like a thousand miles an hour. And and they just are sitting there. No, I'm 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 watching it. and I'm like, man, the, the X-ray glasses, this thing, this is turning into a Robert Rodriguez like kids movie. Yeah, <laughs> I'm loving yes. it. Yes, the Spy Kids evolution continues. Yeah, and then and then of course it turns fully into a Robert Rodriguez kids movie in the next one. But we'll talk. Yeah, about the Spy Kid who loved me. They find out that there's only half of the plutonium that's been stolen from the bomb inside this bomb. The bomb is not actually atomic in any sort of way. So they choose not to disarm it because Bond wants to make it look like they're dead so he can figure out what the hell Elektra's doing. And now they got to go to uh, the Caviar Factory. The to Caviar Factory. This is another scene. Well, I, I think it gets really awesome when it, it's like giant like sauce. Which like, is set up in the beginning. Yeah, they set it up. Bond's in the BMW that gets sawed in half and he looks up and there he sees the helicopter sawing the trees. Yeah, but like, I mean, when they're falling and like nearly hitting Hagrid, that I was like hooting and hollering and even going like, oh, like <laughs> I was scared for, for Hagrid. The rest of the scene is kind of mid, I I, I, I mean, this say. is kind of the definitive action scene for the movie where it's James Bond it versus is. a giant ridiculous thing that looks cool, but it's very slow in how it moves. That You, you just described Robert Dobby, Troy. Don't I know it? Anyway, uh, wait, Melissa, what do you think of this part? I mean, if this is jumping ahead a little bit. No! But I, anytime I speak, notice Troy gets really concerned about time. Well, no, but I actually, I do need to leave in like 30 minutes. <laughs> Don't worry, Troy. We'll, we'll, we'll just mute everything she has to say, but go ahead, Melissa. I was just going to say that I didn't buy the drowning in caviar bit in that oh, scene. Okay. That, yeah. I d oh, yeah, that's I'm not weird. really jumping ahead. I think that's even just before yeah, the, no, the helicopter fine. comes in. So, well, I get these things confused because the movies <laughs> are in one ear, out the other. Uh, but he's literally in this pool and and he could literally just climb out. I don't understand. Are they trying to say he's too fat to climb? I don't buy it's it. It's just they're pouring a lot of caviar in and it's very thick, I think, is the More impression. More than thinking about that, I was thinking about like, you know how people like pay hundreds of dollars to drink uh, Belle Delphine's oh, bath no, water. No. <laughs> it's like, I would pay so much uh, money. We'll give like a million dollars for Valentine's swam in caviar. <laughs> yeah, for for to eat Hagrid's <laughs> caviar. Oh Christ! That he swam in. That he oh was dipped with in. sour cream jam. Yeah, what is that? Who? Why? I'm like, wait, do you eat caviar with sour cream? Yeah, is who that? does that? Yeah, you poor. That's what I you am. Do. I'm on a James Bond podcast in a basement. I'm not rich. I that sounds gross. Also, I totally missed the caviar line. I was like, I thought this was more oil shit, and I'm like, it's not very convincing. <laughs> fake oil, like what? no, it's his caviar factory. He's like, you're like, why is Hagrid eating oil by the car? <laughs> Jan, I think is the only person here who eats caviar. But yes, apparently you can. I don't it. eat caviar like regularly. I've I've eaten it. <laughs> I've eaten it before, but I didn't know you put sour cream with it. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a blend sour cream and then a little caviar. Okay, that I did know. So, moving ahead. Okay, then we get to Istanbul, please. Yeah, yes. no, we get to Big Boom, now we're in the torture chair. Yes. One last screw. <laughs> uh. One last screw. <laughs> I was so rock hard during this entire scene. It's so fucking Yeah, it's a great hot. torture device for James Bond. And Sophie's killing it. She reveals the ear she cut off to convince MI6. No, it's pretty great. Like you actually you actually do feel like it's uh again prototype for the famous uh chair scene in Casino Royale. <laughs> After five turns, 
your neck breaks. After five whips, your balls shatter. <laughs> <Like> <laughs> just shatter. Okay, but the best bit, the highlight of the scene is when Robbie Coltrane comes back. Yeah. And isn't it like they think for a second, like, oh my God, he's bad. She's like, you've achieved your, your whatever. She shoots him. He falls. Yeah. He picks up his cane. It's a his gun. Cane is a giant gun. Yeah. It's a gun. He points it at Pierce, and it's like, oh shit. He points it at her, shoots her, winks at Pierce. No, it's even better. Oh, he frees him. That's right. That's Ends right. up shooting him free. Sophie Marceau says, boy, he really hated you, huh? But he did it. Yeah. He loved him. They he loved him, actually. For some reason, <laughs> yeah. even though he tried to murder him. Even like, though he crippled him. I, I do like uh, Paul's version where... The one to take Sophie out is Hagrid. <laughs> <laughs> in a normal movie, that well, might be how it two. works. Or he, you know, he hit her in the shoulder or whatever. It's it's it's. it's and at effect. this point, M is kind of an afterthought. So like Bond is like chasing Electra up the stairs, and then he hears <laughs> Bond, and he funny. just runs in and then shoots her free, and then <laughs> continues on his way. You're just like, oh, that's it. And then I forget that he <laughs> races Electra King, and he meets her in the bedroom. Right? He's not holding her prisoner there. He finds her in the bedroom. Yeah, she's waiting. No, that's the thing. He didn't need to chase her. Cause she's just like, go ahead and do it. And he's like, okay. And he does. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of like how anticlimactic that whole thing is. But it's is. such a great, like, like, tr like Renard has a nuclear sub in the bay and Electric King is the only one who knows. So he has every incentive to keep her alive. And she's like, you'd miss me, James. And he's like, I resent the implication that I ever liked you. Yeah. I never missed. No, and this, this honestly, this made me think like it would have been maybe more interesting in Dark Knight Rises. Yes. At first, he killed Miranda Tate, and then Bane tries to keep going, like, in this one, because yeah. you have more of a physical foil to defeat. It's not just like, now I just have to imagine the fight. Oh, <laughs> the fucking the way nice, Bane you know? dies in The Dark Knight Rises is not good. It is very horrible. lame, no. I would argue. You all just have to imagine the fire. No, it's, it's hilarious and awesome. It is weird how, like, there's the moment where M comes in and sees Bond and Bond like pets her head yeah. while she's dead. And you're just kind of, you never quite buy that he got to that point of actually kind of feeling bad about shooting her. No, because the screenplay is half based. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it becomes this weird ritualistic murder thing. Like same thing with Paris Carberry. It's like this woman is dead because of me. Bend over. Bend over. Be sad for a sec. I'm done. Go back on with my life. Yeah. It's like a weird right with Pierce Brosnan's Bond. And then this uh, climax that we have in the boat or whatever, I don't find particularly exciting. Is kind of confusing and kind of slow. Again, see, this is my thing. Electric King is dead. The most interesting person is dead and you don't quite know where yeah. you are. It's cramped. Well, all you know is that uh, freaking uh, Renard has a magic dildo that he's trying to put yeah. into the main reactor. Uh, to make the the submarine either leak radiation or blow up. We're not sure. We're not sure what's going on. We don't know where they are. It ain't no hunt for Red October, like in the submarine. No. It's just kind of like, oh, they're sideways now? I don't understand, you know. But like, again, Skyfall did this whole thing much better, which is like, if your bad guy's going to kidnap M, have the climax of the thing be like, oh, I'm going to kill M. I got to save M. M is almost dead. Oh, never mind. No, she's yeah. fine. <laughs> I mean, he, yeah, he no, saved it, Princess Peach. He got her out of the castle. Yeah, so um, <laughs> it turns out Bond, well, because he's a naval commander, he knows how a submarine works and what buttons to press to get out of a torpedo bay. And you're just kind of like, okay, this is a lot of kind of nonsense. I don't really care what's happening. Then we get a fight with the magic dildo. <laughs> I do like this line right here where Renard goes like, you forget, I'm already dead. And then <laughs> Pierce goes like, haven't you heard? So is she. <laughs> you forget. I'm already dead. Haven't you heard? So is she. And he is <laughs> devastated. I'll admit I did appreciate that more of this watch. Like Robert Carlyle sells the devastation. Yeah, someone cares about Electra. <laughs> yeah. No, Robert Carlyle is actually trying to. And I will say, I will give props to Pierce in this movie. It's like, it, it reminded me of like Octopussy, of like how we like when these jokey bonds like have to act intense and like they care. And when Pierce acts like he cares in this movie, like when he's upset or like when he's comforting Electra through a panic attack, mm -hmm. 
he he's really good. Yeah, like, yeah. he's a good actor. Well, I think Pierce Brosnan's. I think he's genuine throughout like all these movies. Like even though he's like having yeah, fun but I mean in the previous two, he's definitely more joking. In this one, he has to be like a little more pissed yes. at times, and he's and that's really why well. I think yeah, Brosnan when he's playing jokey in the pissed, it's because he does have like a complete view of James Bond as a character, and he's trying to do a very faithful portrayal. It's just you realize when he's doing a faithful portrayal that James Bond is a terrible man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> but a terrible man who loves being a terrible man. It's how he stays alive! <laughs> this movie, this is the movie where he's having a little less fun being a monster than usual. Well, the theme yeah. <laughs> of Pierce Brosnan is, I am what I am. I am what I am, and that's all what I am. I'm James Bond. <laughs> Fuck you, got mine. Yeah, he's the beach bum. And then what does he... He have, doesn't he tell like a really lame uh, one-liner to Renard? No, it's not lame, it's amazing. She's waiting for you. She's waiting for you. I thought he, this is when he said, I always wanted Christmas no. in Turkey. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then he presses the button. <laughs> I thought that's what he always says before killing someone. He even says it to Electra King. You'll miss me. I always love Christmas in Turkey. <laughs> but yeah, pretty pretty unexciting climax, but I was happy to see the return of the spy who loved me X post climax. Yeah. Well again, well, literally. It's, it's so twisted to have like, you know, him him he's going dark and complex, but now we're gonna get yeah. you back to the Roger back, back to Moonraker, yeah, of like 007. Oh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. 007. John Cleese has replaced Desmond Llewellyn already in the scene. Desmond is not in the scene, but John Cleese is. I know, Q doesn't even unzipping. Come on. We haven't had an ending where it's uh, MI6 trying to communicate with Bond or find Bond after a mission, but he's fucking since, I think, for your eyes only. No, wait. <laughs> well, how do you count it? Because the way Tomorrow Never Dies end is... Where's Bond? He's been reported missing, sir. No, 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 but here they're actually, like, watching him fuck. Yeah. They're getting the full-on penetration that I want to see in Q, these movies. Q did watch Bond have sex with Pam Bouvier in that fish pool in License to Kill, but that was not That's all true. of them, I said. And that is... Wait, 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 no, there's one more one-liner. I thought Christmas only comes once a year. I thought Christmas only comes once a year. <laughs> and that's how the movie Which is ends. the whole reason why the character is named that. Yeah, they're just like, <laughs> I got this great final line. This is how On Her Majesty's Secret Service should have ended. <laughs> With gunfire. I thought Tracy only comes once. Oh my God! Well, in, the, in the most Christmassy installment, he should have immediately found a lady yeah. named Christmas. Yeah. When, when the cop drives by, he just goes, I always wanted Christmas in Turkey. Freeze frame credits. <laughs> we have all the turkey in the we world. We have all the turkey in the world just for stuffy. And that is the world is not enough. Who wants to go first? Melissa, I think you should go first and give your okay. thoughts on the movie. I know we've talked about it frequently throughout, but your final thoughts. How do you feel well, about this? You know, you've like... talked about it frequently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got to say earlier, I said there really was nothing too horribly misogynist about this movie um, compared to other Bond movies, like anything with Roger Moore and Sean Connery, of course, like it, it doesn't compare. But I, I it will... gets a little better every time, yeah. Yeah, like this is a vast improvement. So I, I still except, except the Roger Moore ones where we regressed. <laughs> yeah, and we got better. Yeah, again. I still largely stand by that statement. But I will say that without going too much into it, I am a little bothered by not the presence of a female villain. I mean, that has a lot of potential, especially one that Bond falls at least cares about, but. The whole, like, she was innocent, she was sexually innocent, but also she's Machiavellian-like thing is pretty gross with Electra King. This idea that, like, they, they care so much for this woman's sexual purity. And I'm like, okay, I don't know when this happened. I'm unclear on the time, like, how, how long it's been since she was kidnapped. But who cares if she was the sluttiest McSlut when she was kidnapped? She was still theoretically raped by her um captors but then also they want to they just want to 
do this weird thing with her being this like sexual deviant and a manipulating woman and that's that's pretty problematic i will say all that sexual subtext that's a fair point i think you might change your mind when you watch the secret of nim 2 <laughs> yes it's the exact same case with the fat eric idol <laughs> okay <laughs> Another movie that I'm not going to watch. Uh, <laughs> but as far as general notes go, um, I don't know, man. These movies are just boring for me. Oh, <laughs> well, it's unfortunate that this yeah. one's a little bit more slower pace compared to the other ones. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, I just it's in one year and out the other. They, they really are that weightless that I'm not well, they concerned. Are for that. Well, so I'm not concerned with keeping up on the plot details, right? Because it's so weightless and inconsequential. But then theoretically there should be something else for me to enjoy and there's very little you know i am okay with action i can even love action when it's in a fantastic movie like die hard you know where the script is terrific characters story and also the action is very well thought out and uh exciting this has none of those things for me i mean the closest thing sure is i guess the hot air balloon and the river thames sequence but uh don't care too much about that either i mean these movies are just not for me uh when jan asked me to join well told me to join the episode he said summoned you he said you're gonna do the world is not enough well because you like sophie and Piers. i and do like sophie i just wanted to see my dead wife again jesus christ give me a break i asked you why <laughs> i asked you why this episode and you were like oh because bond falls in love in this one again and, misrepresented um, <laughs> misrepresented he kind of cares about this person um, but a, a more uh, obvious choice would have been Casino Royale. That's the only Bond movie that I actually like, and I quite like it. I think it's a, a real movie. All of these movies to me are just boredom and wanting to leave and really disgusting misogyny. Like I said, Fatal Attraction is sexist, but man, that movie fucks. Like that movie's so entertaining. That movie also knows what women want, and James Bond movies just don't do it for me in just about any way. Um, I like the theme songs a lot of the time. I like the 60s style when that's a thing, but there's just nothing else for me in these movies. Like, I think the most enjoyment I got out of this was uh, the costume design for Electric King <laughs> was pretty on the, point. The, the subreddit's gonna go crazy on you. Because you know, we treat James Bond with so much reverence on this podcast. Oh, yes. My question is, you know, I asked Jan originally whether Bond fans are misogynist as a whole, and he told me that they're pretty chill, so you probably won't no, want... No, not, not, not at all. No, like, I don't get that vibe, but of course a woman on the internet saying she doesn't like something is <laughs> always risky. It's okay, we do not have listeners. I cannot emphasize enough that <laughs> yeah. no I, one I, I, listens I, I, to I was us. just saying that to get you on the podcast. <laughs> they're all monsters. <laughs> Look, there's only one way to find out, which is releasing this episode. Re releasing this episode and seeing if there's a uh, hatred of vitriol flowing our way, but that's a fair point. I can't believe they didn't like one of the least beloved James Bond movies yeah. of all time. Right. This is the episode that finally lands us either in Nebula or in the Daily Wire Plus. Only time will tell. <laughs> Only time will tell. Wow, I'm honored. <laughs> I'm honored to have been yeah. helpful in that. America decides. America decides, yeah. but the it's... free market, baby. <laughs> just, just like Hagrid says, the free market is going to be the death of. Jake, oh, God. put the seppuku down. You don't need to coo the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to stab myself in front. I just want an audience. <laughs> From one out of ten, how do you rate the movie and Pierce Brosnan's hair? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so the movie, I'm gonna give, I don't know, like maybe a four. Uh, I mean, Got for it. me, the ratings are always skewed because they're all pretty much starting out at like two. <laughs> out of <laughs> <Maybe> ten? one. <laughs> so yeah, so four is pretty <laughs> generous for me. Every, every James Bond movie just starts out at two and it can get higher or lower. Oh, <laughs> pretty much. <no. laughs> so this movie just, this movie got this higher This is truly actually. our most haunted episode ever. <laughs> I'm being generous. I'm being generous. Because for me, like, Casino Royale is maybe like an eight or a nine. And that's as high as it gets. No James Bond movie is a 10 out of 10. Skyfall's maybe like a seven. Uh, no, this movie is fine. Um, it's really boring, uh, but it has Sophie Marceau and I get to look at her and I get to, I don't know, just 
vibe with that. Uh, it's trying to do some interesting things, but it's it's failing in a lot of them. One point just for Robbie Coltrane. Um, <laughs> yeah. and another point for the song i don't know like it's a pretty those points are stacking up yeah i don't know four five. now it's at least a six no 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 i was gonna say if it's fine then it should be like a five out of ten the reason it's still like a four is it's so boring it's so boring uh, yeah and christmas jones that that's such a stupid name all for one stupid <laughs> fucking You don't mind the character, joke. you just mind the name. Yeah, I have no hate for you, Denise Richards. Like, I, I support you. I don't hate her for this movie. I just hate the Christmas Jones name. I hate that character. I also gotta say, that stupid fucking line, she's like, you speak English very well for a Russian. And, and I'm like, yeah, also, uh, he speaks terrible fucking Russian. That should be a clue right there. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, yeah, that's a- f That's classic Pierce. That, you gotta love him. This is classic Bond. He's the worst spy ever. I shouldn't say this at this time because, well, I don't know what year we're living in, <laughs> but I'm dead anyway, right? But uh, Russia's been up to some <laughs> nefarious things of late, right? So I'm not, I'm not making any friends here, but- uh, I'm a little sensitive to Slav representation, so uh, stuff like that can bother me, I guess. Well, uh, Russia is doing Slav on Slav crime right True. now. True. Yeah, they're doing a good enough job of that. But I don't know, I'm sick of the trope of like evil Russians in every single movie in general, not just to the Bond franchise. Of course, until more recently, maybe... Uh, that's not a cool thing to say. <laughs> well, luckily, it is the year 2021, so Russia hasn't done anything yeah. in real life to make themselves look <laughs> yeah. like the villain. I mean, they only annexed Crimea in... Oh, wait, huh? <laughs> that was a long time ago. But, uh, but enough about the annexation of Crimea. What did you think of Pierce Brosnan's hair, Melissa? Specifically his hair? It looked great underwater. It looked great, like, all the time. So, I'll, I mean, I'll give it, like, a... A solid eight. Good. Ten points for Sophie Marceau's hair. That's all I gotta say. Yes, her hair is very good in this. Um, Perfect hair. As usual, I'm going to take, get the bullshit that I have to say out of the way to pretend this is a fun podcast. Uh, <laughs> Pierce Brosnan's hair. I'm harsh on it. I was going to go six out of ten. I guess it's a oh, seven out what? of ten. Look, here's the issue. In GoldenEye, he had the Remington Steel cut, which was perfect for his version he of the James mullet. Bond. Yeah. It's not a true mullet. It's just, it's a buffont. It's a little more volume to it. He goes very business in his next three movies. And in Here and Die Another, D Another Day, it's very short. I just can't vibe with short hair. I'm just not a short hair kind of guy. Oh, I'm the opposite. I'm Sorry. a Russian. Most women are. And most men and most people are. Uh, it's like the luscious locks for me. That's where it's at. So I'll be nice and say he wears it well. So it's like a seven out of 10. This is supposed to be your favorite Pierce Brosnan no, movie. No, no, that's what I was going to say. All right, so the movie. It was widely hated at the time. Uh, Denise Richards won an undeserved Raspberry for Worst Actress. Really? Um, yeah, she was the first Bond Aww. actor to win a Razzie, which, what? Aww. No. That's, yeah. It's not that bad. For this franchise? Well, Tanya Roberts was nominated and should have won compared to Denise Richards. Anyway, this movie has been reevaluated in later years. When I first went through all the movies, it was my favorite Pierce Brosnan movie. Watching it again, I admit, I was curious. I'm like, is this going to be an octopusy situation where I love it even more on a rewatch? It is not. It is still my favorite Pierce Brosnan movie by a hair. It's really between this and Tomorrow Never Dies because they're such inverse of movies. Tomorrow Never Dies is all about the action and, and the adventure and the suspense. This is more a movie about the character study. And I love when the movies do character stuff. So I guess this is what it comes down to is, do you think the character stuff in this movie works? For me, it does. For me, I love seeing Bond and Elektra and M all kind of negotiating their relationships, trying to out evade each other. I think that puts Bond in an interesting situation. To quote Barbara Broccoli, he thinks he's found his Tracy, but it's actually his Blofeld and trying to convince everyone else that this wholesome, culturally aware, smart businesswoman is actually evil. And it's like, oh, he's just being James Bond. Of course he doesn't trust her. But then he's proven right. That's interesting to me. You can say it's half-baked. And obviously, if I thought it was fully baked, this would be a five-star movie for me. And it's not. 
Now, my hot take is, do I still think it's more baked here than in Skyfall? And I would say, yes, I would feel the M Electric King relationship is more interesting. Oh. Well, I actually don't disagree with that, <laughs> but I love Skyfall. Yes, Raul Silva is just a Joker knockoff. This has an interesting mother-daughter dynamic that you don't see anywhere else in the series. All the relationships are really unique, and I really dig that, and I dig the evasion. The action is interesting enough for me to like it, and that it's all hot air balloons and lumberjack helicopters and nonsense like that. But it is not as good as Tomorrow Never Dies because Michael Apted is an actor's director. He's not an action director. I like this movie still. It still is my favorite browsing movie by hair because I like when the movies are about character. This explores an interesting aspect of the James Bond character, which is that he usually is so trusting of the Bond women. And this time he is not. And it's an interesting way to spice up the character. And the tragedy does play for me. I can't begrudge anyone who is mad that they went more supervillain with Sophie Bar Marceau as opposed to not being a supervillain. At one point, the original ending was Bond sees Electric King getting treatment for Stockholm Syndrome. And I'm like, thank God they didn't do that because that would have been so half-baked. That's lame. Yeah, the way he takes her out here is like perfect for this character. That would have been like the ending to The Secret of Nim 2 when they cure the fat mouse. Exactly, exactly like the ending to The Secret of Nim 2. It, it just completely defangs her character the, yes. where it yeah. just amounted to Stockholm Syndrome. Right. It's like, no. There's no agency. She's calculating about everything she's done to get to this point. Which is also problematic in its own way, but there's a an in-between, you know? I guess the fact that she uses her sexuality is the problematic aspect, but like the yeah. idea, well, but she so still has Bond. agency because because she has a, well, yeah, so does Bond. Just like the fat mouse in Secret of Nim 2. He's too sexy. He uses his sexuality <laughs> against his captors. But he, but, she, but she's still planning out everything. Yes, like she's smart. Where she's making a choice. She's yeah, not like yeah, yeah. a victim of another guy. She's mad about being sold out and she makes the conscious choice to do all these things to kill her dad and to make a bunch of money. <laughs> I will say this. It is interesting when you really think about it. M puts her on a pedestal as the virginal, like M and Renard both think that she is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And James and is. Bond is the yeah. only one to be like, no, she's a person like anyone else and she's bad. And Christmas Jones is also like, yeah, she's bad. So it's like interesting to see like how she is put on a pedestal by other people, but James Bond is morally superior for not putting her on a pedestal. I think it, it would have been more interesting if Bond put her on a pedestal and then like he can like deal with her being bad because that's what Casino Royale does. Yeah exactly is. that's what Casino Royale does and, it, and that movie's better. This movie's pretty good to wrap up my thoughts really quick I feel the Brazen era gets better from movie to movie to movie <laughs> and this is still the climax for me. I might switch if I think about it a little more Tomorrow Never Dies could top it but what this and Tomorrow Never Dies and Goldeneye and even Die Another Day have in common is great villains. Electric King is like a top five Bond villain for me. I would give this movie still an eight out of 10. So you're saying uh, this is the climax and Die Another Day is like the post-coital shame? Oh yeah, Die Another Day is <laughs> off like a steep, it, it's like the Pierce Brosnan era is that Price is Right game with the Swiss hiker where it's going up and up and up. And, and then it just has like a steep like drop. Oh no. <laughs> All right, Jan, what are your thoughts? My toy. Okay, the hair. Yes, it's shorter, and I do prefer it uh, longer uh, on Pierce. I do prefer the golden eye style. He looks a little more professorial here. Uh, when he's uh, wet, it seems like it's thinning a bit. He's pushing 50 already, but I don't care that it's shorter. I don't care that it's thinning. He pulls it off. It looks fantastic. It's another 10 out of 10, Yay! baby. <laughs> He is Pierce. the fucking hair king. Um, the movie. Just like Troy, I like when these movies are about character, but just because they're about character, it doesn't immediately make them good. I think if they're gonna... You have to execute the idea. Yeah, if, if you're gonna do a character study, you have to go fully for it. The only movie that's really ever done it is Casino Royale. Here... It's pretty fucking half-baked, and like I said, to me, the main problem with this movie is that Michael Apted seems to be more focused on the character stuff, uh, but the screenplay seems to be 
constantly reverting the focus back into the action. And the action, besides some fun sequences here and there, is not that strong. The directing style in this movie is not that strong in general. I think Pierce here is doing a really good job. Everyone else is fine, I guess. No one's like a standout. I like Robert Carlyle. I like uh, Sophie Marceau. Denise Richards, even. I think she's really good. But yeah, this is one of those Bond movies that's like a pretty passive experience to me. And with this one's even a little more frustrating because it could have been so much more than what it was. It's also kind of like a stark contrast coming from Tomorrow Never Dies, where the action in that is like a 10 out of 10. And the pacing in that movie is so fucking tight and it flies by. And I think I like it more the, the more I think of it. This one, maybe I like a little less the more I think of it. But even though it's probably still my least favorite of the Brosnan movies, it's not my least favorite one by far. I think they're all pretty good. This is just the one that engages me the least for reasons previously mentioned. Wait, so you are including Die Another Day when you say that? Yes. Oh, oh, yes. oh right. I got to prepare myself for next what's week. Your, okay. What's your number score, Jan? I give it like a six. I th like, I don't think it's a bad movie. I think it's a very fun watch, but uh, not one of my favorite ones. Well, Jan, you kind of hit the nail on the head for me. Yeah, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too, where it's, we're getting into the character stuff. We got to cut to an action scene, but then there's not enough action scenes and the movie is paced a little bit slower in service of the character stuff that's not fully developed that you have less action scenes as a result. So it ends up kind of being very middling. <laughs> not to say that it's bad. It's still very enjoyable at parts. Like the beginning scene is great. The action scenes are still fun. It's just coming right off of Tomorrow Never Dies. I think that partially is kind of affecting my opinion, but even on its own, Pierce is still great though. Um, yeah, no, Denise Richards gets unfair treatment. She's perfectly adequate <laughs> as Christmas yeah. Jones. She's not but not the worst Bond girl by any stretch of the imagination. She is a Bond girl. Yeah, she she <laughs> she is a, the definition of a Bond girl. She's fine. Uh, Sophia Marceau is is a ton of fun as Electra. I like her turn. But then again, you're not given like an, a sufficient character time to actually buy into Bond and her her relationship. So you never really get the love story. And yeah, I would agree. This is my least favorite of the Pierce Brosnan movies. And like I said, that doesn't mean it's in the conversation for worst Bond movie, not by any stretch of the imagination, because I think the Pierce Brosnan era is pretty consistent. We're the most consistent by far. Yeah, they're they're all really good. And even its worst one, which is my opinion, this movie is still <laughs> much better than a good chunk of the Bond movies. So, yeah, I'm going to give this one a six <laughs> out of ten. Why do you guys do this? <laughs> Because we hate ourselves yeah. and we're unemployed. <laughs> no, no, I, I think about this a lot on the podcast. We're all like, let's talk about James Bond. Eh. <laughs> but we've been talking for two and a half hours now. So let me finish the hairpiece so Paul can say his thing and we can end this bitch. Okay. My wife? Oh, yeah, oh shit. That's my bad. <laughs> Poor choice of words. I'm so sorry. Don't haunt me, Melissa. I'm so sorry. The one time we have a woman guest and you choose to say those I words. I choose to say <laughs> Oh, no. And I'm editing it, so you know I'm keeping it. Oh, I know it. you're keeping it. Anyway, so Pierce Brosnan's hair, I actually really like it when it's short. Uh, I actually prefer it as to when it's long, <laughs> even though it's very luscious looking in GoldenEye and Tomorrow Never Dies. Kind of like with Sean Connery with the toupee, it kind of looks very like, you know, like cartoony where it's like, it's always like great. <laughs> you know, it always looks great. Mm. I think that was just him. Yeah, no, exactly. But it's real. That's the thing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a 10 out of 10. It's just a different different style, and I like the style more. Anyway. Oh, no. All right, quick, get the Ouija board out. We need Jake to finish right, the episode. Well, we're gonna need we're going to need a seance <laughs> to bring him back to, 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 to set us free. The hair, it's, he's still a 10 out of 10. I'm curious. <laughs> why, I want to know what, happened, what the deal with the scar is. Maybe it's just lit differently. Although, fun fact, Jake, you know this is the DP of the mummy. <laughs> oh. What? <laughs> It looks just as good as the Robert Elswood one. I got it. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. It's it looks it's fine. It looks good. Um, it's a very good looking. The Brosnan era is very good looking wow. in general until we get to die another day. Everybody in this movie is very hot, including Robbie Coltrane. Easy on the eyes, <laughs> Robbie. Yeah, this movie gets points for story ambition. It gets points for following through on that stuff a little more. It doesn't completely wave away these things at the end, like. 
GoldenEye or The Spy Who Loved Me even did. All right, God damn it, Paul. <laughs> but the execution overall is still wonky. Funnily enough, I'm like, really, the only essential thing about this movie is the fucking blowout banger all-time action opening. Yeah. And the rest does not live up anywhere. Totally anymore. agree. So it's still, it's probably a 6.5 or something. We'll see how next week turns out. <gasps> I'm so excited! No, yeah, it's going to be so much fun. Guys, that was a great episode. Wasn't it fun talking to my dead wife, Melissa? Jan, I can't believe you were that obsessed with Sophie Marceau's clothes. That was so weird when you were just talking about how much you liked looking at her clothes. What? No, that was Melissa. No. Yeah, the, and and there was extended parts of this podcast where it was just the wind blowing. And, yeah, no, it was. And uh, creaking uh, in the attic, you know. For some reason, you kept saying I was cutting you off. But, like, there was no one talking. Yeah, no, it was really weird. What do you mean? Guys, Melissa, like, came back to life, and we talked about the world is not enough what? for, like, three hours. What the hell are you talking about? Jan, this is not the live and let die episode. There is no supernatural occurrences. In yeah, the this is, you're, you're getting this confused with another podcast. This podcast is science fact. Yeah, we're science factions over Did here. Did I just make... This whole thing up, Jan. You were never even married, hey, Jan. There was one oh. point where you kept saying that I killed myself. You know, like yeah, and you came back to life. No, what are you talking no. about? I'm, I've been here what? this entire time. We've actually been waiting to record this episode. Yeah, Jan, I have to go to an improv show. So I've never even been married. My life is literally no. You just... were married. Your wife is dead, though. <laughs> oh my god. So so my life now is literally just talking about James Bond movies for hours on end. Yes. Yeah, that's all we are, Jan. That's all we'll ever be. We there's no love for us in the spy. Game. Oh my god. Excuse me guys, I I gotta I just gotta think about my life a little bit. Anyway, we'll see you guys next week when we talk about die another day. Goodbye. Goodbye! Oh god, this was depressing.